Jeff, do we want to start then? And Master Assemblies. Yeah, we could go ahead and, and start. Uh, we're recording, so uh, we can uh, show uh, Tom whatever he misses in a video. Okay. Sounds good. Well, what I have uh, a couple of years ago, I made a video. And what we were going to do is we were going to produce this video and make a long story short, it, we put it all together and we didn't put it out there. We didn't uh, take it to, we were going to take it to the outdoor channel and put it on TV or whatever. But it, it's a nice beginning to uh, show basically the whole mindset of what uh, NASTRA is all about. And so we'll just play it, the, the introductory part. And don't worry about trying to take notes or do whatever. If it's recorded, we'll all be able to look at it and go back over the PowerPoint and everything anyway. So I'll just start this. We'll watch it for a little bit and then uh, we'll go into the the actual PowerPoint presentation. I'm smart enough to start it here. Welcome to the National Shoot to Retreat Association's Dog of the Year competition. We have the top 192 dogs in the country and Canada here to compete for the title of 2018 Dog of the Year. For those of you not familiar with NASTRA, it was an organization that was started right here in Amo, Indiana in 1978 by bird hunters looking for a way to extend their season and give them something to do when wild bird numbers made it difficult to get quality work in with their bird dogs. First, let's visit with Michael Mulberry to have him explain to us how the 192 dogs qualified to be here this week. 2018 dog of the year. We're all fighting to bring this trophy home right here. And uh, this is kind of, this is our Super Bowl out of our top five nationals. This is the 100, top 192 dogs in the country. To kind of go into uh, how these dogs are selected. How, how are these 192 dogs the ones that are eligible to be? Yeah, again, it's, it's um, determined by their finish in their regional championships. Uh, those dogs that, uh, that win their regional championships are automatically qualified for entry. Uh, then we'll determine the further entrance down the list, second, third, fourth place finishes. We get quotas based on the number of dogs that do compete in each regional championship. Some of them have, have a larger field uh, than others. Sure. A dog is not eligible if they don't compete in their regional championship. Before we begin, let's take a look at the scoring and format that is used for a NASTRA event. Brace, a randomly selected pair of dogs and handlers run together for 30 minutes in a specified field, each with their own judge. The scoring categories include fine score, retrieve score, obedience score, ground coverage score, back score. The fine score plus factors are exceptional style, remain steady regardless of interference, extreme intensity, hard slam point, remains high and intent during long flush attempt, good game location, work set intelligently. Minus factors are flagging, tail wagging during point, lack of intensity, creeping, taking slow steps toward game, low tail, down in front, high head and tail is preferable, and laying down. Retrieve score plus factors include quick location of down bird, quick pickup, blind retrieve, dog did not see the bird go down, but trust handler's direction toward it, snappy return to handler, easy return to handler, exceptional retrieves such as water or an extra long retrieve. Minus factors are trouble locating bird, slow pickup, hard mouth, indirect return, unwilling release. Obedience score plus factors are displays immediate response to handler's commands, consistently responds to handler. Minus factors are failure to respond to handler. Ground coverage score plus factors include quick and thorough search for birds such as quartering, sharp, classy movements. Minus factors include pottering with ground scent, running and not actually handling such as head racing, not covering the ground thoroughly, spending time out of bounds, lack of enthusiasm. 
Back score plus factors. Backs immediately upon seeing pointing dog. Dog is intent with good style. Remains intent until handler reaches dog to control him while pointing dog completes his retreat. Minus factors, lacks intensity. Flags, wags or moves tail. Lays down, has low tail or low in front. Looks at handler rather than pointing dog. So let's look in on some round one, day one action. Everybody, everybody see that? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we're getting it. Okay, good. good. I just, I was hoping the video feed was fast enough so everybody could see it without being blurry. So, as, as that kind of explained everything real fast, we're going to go through it again and uh, just go through this slideshow. Again, if you have a question or something comes up, you, you're not sure if I don't explain it, well, just stop me. We can go through it. And if we're going really fast, it, it, you know, like you can't take notes or something, but we always have it recorded, so we should be able to uh, look at it again here. But this is basically the judging slide presentation that's given to all judges, trainers. And we go through this. Normally, I hand out the actual slides so you can take notes on it and do that kind of thing. But uh, obviously, with the Zoom conference, we're not able to do that. So we'll just kind of go through it. All this pretty self-explanatory. This is You can find the judging rule book online on the nastra.org page so you can actually go through all of the rules um right? and also dean i hate to interrupt um if everybody could mute mute yourself just if you have something to say pop in but just to keep the background noise down and then if anyone does want a copy of the powerpoint i believe we can i can email that out to you right dean what's that copy of the powerpoint yes absolutely yeah, I can. So you can email us, get a hold of us, Facebook us, message us, whatever you need to do. We can mail you a copy of the PowerPoint as well. Um, probably should have done that prior, but actually, Christy, um, I'm in the process of putting together a website for our chapter. Uh, is this is this okay to put online for that as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. So. Um, yeah, we can uh, put that out there and, and everybody can uh, look at it there. So as that video went through, there's different categories. Almost everything is scored zero to 100 with the exception of obedience and backing scores. Okay, so everything else retrieves uh, the fines and ground coverage are all based zero to 100 points. So for starters, we'll start with fine scores. Basically, the thing that most judges do is say, okay, what's average? What, what is average? Well, there, there's a bunch of information out there that says zero to 30 is very poor, you know, you know, anything from 80 and above is excellent. Well, you're going to find that when you get people out judging that they don't use the full range like they should. So you have to be real careful of looking at those guidelines because invariably 90% of the people will end up judging dogs and they'll all be real good work. Well, all the dogs don't do good work. And so you have to just be real careful with the, the thing I would encourage you is when you start judging, even I don't care if you're at a national level judge is you get with the other person you're judging with and when you observe the dog work together you discuss what you saw and what score you would give that work so if, if you happen to be beside each other and you both even though one judge isn't judging say dog a but they both see dog a do is fine and everything you discuss it together and go, what kind of scores are you giving? The other thing you talk about is halfway through a brace, you want to switch who you're judging. That way you both get a look at both dogs. You both get some uh, feedback on both dogs and you're both able to uh, 
critique the dog's work. Now, every find is different, but at least you will have some idea where to start. Okay? So when we look at finds, as you can see, there's things that can make a find score go up. We call them plus factors. And there's things that can make find scores go down. And we call them minus factors. And so what you do is when you see a dog go on point, what you do is say, okay, this is where I'm starting. Where am I starting with it? You will hear people say they're going to start at 75. They're going to start with 75 points being average. And then they will work scores up from 75 and they'll work scores down. So there's, there's certain things that as part of a find, you've got to keep in, in the back of your brain and say, okay, I've got to leave room for unbelievable dog work to score above it and differentiate from an average find. And I got to leave room, obviously, then for really bad dog work to be able to go low. What you'll find when new judges start is a lot of times they'll score from about 75 to 85, and 90% of the dogs they score is, is all scored in that range. Well, dog work isn't that consistent. You need to spread your scale out, and, and it just takes time. The other thing judges worry about is you know, offending the handler sometimes because the handlers, oh, you know, that, that person's an experienced handler. I don't dare score his dog for it. You're doing them an in service as well. Don't be afraid to score the dogs what they deserve, whether they're, you know, national champion handlers or, or beginning amateurs. If, if, you, if you use full scale, then you, then you have nothing to justify at the end of the day. Okay? Questions? All right, let's go through this. Uh, I, we're going to show videos to, to, to do some of this as well, and, and some of this will make more sense as we go. Um, when you're looking at plus factors, you don't want a dog laying down. You don't want a dog crouching. You don't want a dog flagging. Flagging has varying degrees of severity. Uh, there's three types of flagging. Usually it's a sliding scale. Zero to five, uh, six to 10, and 11 to 15. So let's say you have a dog that's, when it finds a bird, starts flagging. When it's finding the bird. And as soon as it locates the bird, it stops. Okay? It's a deduction, but it shouldn't be severe. We call that a one to five point deduction. And you use that sliding scale that way. If you have a dog that flags, the handler walks over, and after the dog has stopped moving, other than the flagging tail, the handler might say, whoa, and then the dog stops, or they walk over, and as soon as the handler just gets close, then they stop. Okay. Is that more severe that the dog flagged longer? Yeah, it should be. So that's a from a six to a 10 point deduction. And then when you get a dog that the entire time it finds the bird and it's sitting on point and the handler comes over and flushes the bird and the tail never stops wagging, then, then obviously it's a more severe. Now we're talking 11 to 15 point deduction. So that's how you would use that sliding scale in that sense. So if you started at an average fine of say 75 and the dog flagged through the entire fine and nothing else happened, you're looking at a minimum of 15 points coming off of there, a maximum of 15 points. You're down to a 60 on a fine. The other thing that you look at on a fine, and it, it, it's not in here in the, in the minus other than it's called creeping, is dogs taking steps. Once a dog stops and establishes position and it's no longer moving, the handler calls point or find. Okay. Now, if the dog starts taking steps again, okay, now what you need to do is you need to deduct two points from that find for every step that dog takes. 
So now you're back to counting deduction points. So you could have a dog that starts off at a 75 and takes 10 steps. Okay, you're taking 20 points off that fine. Okay, so there's there's these factors that you just you just kind of want. And again, these are guidelines. Not everybody's gonna see it the same way. When you see a good hard slam point, you see a dog that stands tall, tails high, heads high, you, you want to reward that. And you want to see one that stays steady. I mean, if there's another dog coming in and, and it doesn't honor the dog and takes the point away or flushes the bird while the dog is on point, if that dog stands still for that interference, you want to reward that. And the scores would go way up accordingly. So th those are just some things how to look at the, the fine scores. Okay, same thing with retreats. What can you punish a dog for? What can you reward a dog for? You know, does it sprint over to the down bird? Does it pick it up? Uh, maybe he didn't see the bird go down. A handler might throw shells. A handler might give hand signals and point. And the dog responds to it and finds the bird. Well, you want to reward that. That's a blind retreat. When, when the dog comes in, is it mouthing a bird? or is it holding it? I mean, a dog brings in a bird that let's say the handler didn't kill, but he, he ran it down. He missed the bird, the dog ran it down. So now all of a sudden we have a great big long retreat. He brings the, dog, the bird back and the bird's still alive. That means he's got a soft mouth, okay? And, and, and you wanna reward that type of retreat. If you get one that's chomping on it, coming in or you get one that drops the bird on the way in, if a, you, you figure every time a dog drops a bird, you're gonna deduct about 10 points. So if you have a dog that brings a bird in and the handler has to wrestle with it to take the bird away from its mouth, again, minus factor. Things that you wanna, you wanna uh, deduct the scores from. And if you, if you use this whole range, you can easily see what good retrieves are, what bad retrieves are. I always just tell judges, you know, think back to previous fines, other dogs. How did this find that I'm judging right now compared to those other ones? And I wanna make sure that when I'm all done with my scoring, that this dog scored better or worse because it was better or worse than the fine that I'm comparing it to. And so those kind of things happen. You, when, you, when you're judging, you're gonna to wanna to be able to just think about guidelines. What, what can I say about this, this fine, this particular fine? What can I say about this retreat? These are some good things about this retreat. Oh, here are some bad things about this retreat. You wanna have that. And if you have to write notes on the bottom of your card to remind you, you can do that as well. Anybody questions yet? Ian, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Is the way to do it, like we have up here in Canada, it's, you know, we're always seeing 90s and everything. And you see some of the American guys that come up here and they're blown away when they see the 90s. It's, I've heard different stories where, just going back a bit, is it more the two judges get together at the beginning of the brace and choose a set number, like you said, whether that's 75 or 80, and then deduct or, or raise? based on that number? Is that the better way to do it as opposed to just picking a number of random um, and judging the dog like, oh, he slammed on points. That's, well, I'm gonna give him an 82 for a fine. Well, what, what you, that's a great question, John. What you don't wanna have is having two judges see the same piece of work and give different scores. Exactly, yeah. And so to alleviate that, you both gotta kind of agree on where you're gonna be on an average. And, and that's, and, and again, different people have different methods. If you've judged with another person and know how they judge, sometimes you realize that, well, this person judges a lot higher than I normally do. So you kind of got to meet them with their scores or they got to kind of meet you with their scores. What you don't want to have, John, is you don't want to have two people watch the same dog work and give a score 10 points apart. Yeah. And a lot of us like we'll get together and we'll say, 
Hey, and, and in, in America, most fines, you, you pretty much go on an average, most fines and most retrieves start at an 80. And then you plus or minus from there. To get a 90, you better darn well see something that's gonna be phenomenal. You better see a water retrieve. You better see uh, a find where there's been interference. I mean, so there's lots of different ways to plus that into that 90 range. But again, it doesn't matter. We used to, we, and I always say, I don't care if the judge gives me a 50 or gives me a 40, as long as that's where they're starting for everybody. As long as you're consistent throughout your entire day, it doesn't matter what the score is, ultimately, as long as it's consistent judging with every single, if you're going to start at 50 and plus or minus from 50, then you and your judge are on that same page. So it doesn't matter as long as it's consistent. So it's tough if you're judging with two different judges, if you have two different judges that see this different, they yeah. do it one way, another guy does it the other way, it's tough, but okay. That's why, that's why we always talk about in advance. Hey, where are we going to start? What's an average fine? That's what we do. Now, again, every region probably does it a little bit different, but that's why when you're working with somebody new, you just want to touch base with them. I, I, I judge with guys from all over the country, and I will insist that when we are done with the Braves, we get together, we meet in the middle of the field, we talk about the bird work that we saw, that we both saw, if it was the same dog and say, okay, here's what I'm getting for fine scores. Here's what I'm getting for uh, obedience scores. Here's what I'm getting for ground coverage. And as long as we're close and we, we have a pretty good feel for each other, we're good to go. And we might do it every brace for the first five, six braces. We might do it all day. We might do it a couple times ago. Yeah, we're good. And it just, it just matters. You want consistency between the two. And, and so there's different ways. We like to meet beforehand, say what we're starting at, and then go from there. See, and with the CKC, we always started at 100%, and the dog worked his way down. So I think there's a little bit of a difference. So you have to be on the same page when you start. The, the problem with starting at 100% is how to reward plus factors. I mean, well, usually a dog makes a mistake, and then when he does the plus factor, he, he builds himself back up. So yeah. you're slowly working his score down, down, down. Then you hit something that's amazing in the in the, the second retrieve or something like that. Then the score will start coming back up. But we always started at 100%. Everybody started at the same level. And there's five judges here that we finished. We're within one or two marks of each other whenever we do a dog. So When, when we show some of these training videos of dog work, we're going to call on individual people to uh, critique it. And then I want you to show me, because I've never seen that done. I've heard of it being done, yeah. but I, I, I've never understood how you could do it if you started off excellent and, or you started off just average. It wasn't really a good find. It was kind of loose, sloppy. How you, yeah. how you I think the difference is, is because we're not really in a competition. We're being, we're judging a dog against a score. So I think that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. against the standard rather. So got it. Yeah. Yeah, that might be it. And, it, and right. you look at the NASTRA guidelines. It does say 80 to 100 is an excellent, or 90 to 100, I forgot. I have to go back and look at that. It's saying it's 80 to 100 is in that excellent range. And 60 yeah. to 80 is in a good range. And so yeah. it's a matter of using that whole piece, that whole, the whole, uh, the whole judging range. Right. Well. I, th I think your setup is good because, like I said, it gives you the – the chance to be variable and the, the dogs will shine, the good dogs will shine and the bad dogs I, I like it so much, but you're right, Don. I mean, up here, I mean, like I said, we're seeing 90s. They're just picking a random number, like Chrissy said, 80 to 100 is excellent. Ah, we'll give them a 95 or whatever, 87. They just pick out of the air. That's cool. All right, next slide. Back score. Remember, there was two things that only get a total of 75 potential backing and obedience. So the best back you can find is going to be scored up to a 75. And again, plus factors, it's going to back immediately. The dog stays intent. You see a lot of dogs that see another dog on point, they stop and they turn and look for their handler. They lose their intent. They're not a good back. The dog should look 
just like the dog that's pointing. There should be the same intensity. That is something very rarely seen. Most dogs will stop and just kind of stand there and look at the other dog like, oh, I've been trained to stop and I know I'm supposed to stop, but I'm not enjoying it and I have no intensity. So you get- And our, we have two dogs that are completely different. We will have one dog that points, at, she backs with more intensity than she points and it's insane. And, and my dog will back and then turn around and look at me and won't ever look again at the pointing dog and I should be getting 30 and 40 backs because she'll never look at that backing dog ever again because she's like, I can't believe you're making me do this. And that's a 30 or 40 back tops in my book. And we have a dog, she was talking about her other dog who she can see a dog. This is no lie. She can see a dog from 300 yards away on point and she will stop and become as intense. And the judge thinks she's pointing. That's judging her. Well, think she's pointing on her own. I'm like, no, she's backing. He says, what are you talking about? I say, look, and he'll go, he'll get down, he'll get over her back and he'll look at the other guy and he says, oh my God, he can see that dog, you know? Yeah. Then it's just like, it's crazy how some dogs enjoy backing and how some dogs don't. Some will lay down, some will look at the handler, you know, they lack that intensity. You just got to compare. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. I'll show you a couple of good backs. I'll show you some bad backs. I'll show you some zero backs. That's the other concept. If a dog refuses or looks at the back and then turns away, you have to zero that back. You take the, the, the ability. They can't come back later and score another back if they back the next one. Once they have their first backing opportunity, that's the one that is scored, whether good, bad, or indifferent. All right, so ground coverage. Ground coverage and obedience are probably the two toughest things to judge. Ground can, coverage. Sorry, can we back that for a second on the back? Okay, you said you're scored on the first back. So if the dog does perfect on the first back and then blows two after that, he still gets a good score. Still gets his back score. Correct. Okay. If he right. zeroes the first one and backs five more times, he's still getting a zero. I understand that part. Okay. Right. It, but Don, that's where obedience, your obedience um, scores start coming into play. So even though okay. they scored that first back and then they refused to back from then on, that's when you start getting hammered on obedience. Okay. Right. And that brings up what Chrissy said, brings up a good point. If you zero a back, you better hammer the obedience score. You don't, you, you can't give a dog a 60 plus obedience score if they ran by and refused to back or ran in and stole point. That's, that's poor obedience. And so you need to, you need to uh, punish the dog for that lack of obedience. Okay. Okay. So ground yeah. covers, like I said, probably the hardest thing to judge. A dog just kind of trolls along and finds four birds. Is it covering the whole field? Probably not, but it found four birds. How do you how do you differentiate if only five birds are planted and the dog finds four of the five birds do you say the ground coverage was good well they might have just it, it, it how do you it, it's a combination of things do they quarter do they cover the whole field do they find birds i know dogs that run crazy and cover the entire field and they come back with zero birds. Well, is that good ground coverage if they're not finding birds? How do you, you know, you see dogs chase other dogs around the field for a while. You see dogs spending time out of bounds. Is that good ground coverage if five minutes they're out of bounds? A dog will get DQ'd when he has been out of bounds for 10 minutes out of a 30 minute race. Okay. What is not written in the rule books, but is a suggestion and is used by a lot of regions as, as a guideline, is people will take away five points on ground coverage for every minute out of bounds. 
Now, is that a rule that you're going to find in the rule book? No, but it gives you a reference point. So if, if a dog's been out of bounds for five minutes, according to that system, you should lose a minimum of 25 points from, from as a reference, again, to how to score that ground coverage because th th they're not where they're supposed to be. Question. Uh, in the event, let's, let's just say a dog clearly bites tracks, boom, 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 four birds, one after another, great finds, everything. You're still going to dock on the ground coverage because not quartering or that, that kind of thing, or is that what you're trying to say? And there's where there's where you <laughs> run into the discrepancy, John. I, I'm, I'm, I, you've got to take it into consideration that if a dog tracks, and some dogs can do that. Some of the better dogs in the country oh, actually course. track a bike. Yeah. They follow the bike tracks and go right to the birds. 100%. Yeah. So you can't, you can't destroy them on, on ground coverage. In fact, most of the time, they will score exceptionally well. Okay. Right. So. Okay. Now. If, if you have nothing else to go on, but the way the dog handles, it's quartering, it's, it's looking, it's going where the owner commands. The owner says, we're going over here. He go, you go over there. Okay, you, you can reward that, even if that dog doesn't find very many birds. Okay. So it, it, like I said, it's, a real, it's a real, real difficult to give people direction on ground coverage. It's the most difficult thing to score. I think with us, with the CKC, we look to see if the dog is actually going to where a bird would normally be in his normal habitat as opposed to the middle of a field. Like if he's hitting the hedgerows, he's hitting the, the clumps of trees or the high grass, he's hunting the ground. If he's out in the middle of the field, normally you don't find a wild bird and out there. That's where Nastra is so different because Nastra, you don't usually have thick cover in the middle no. of your fields. No. You might have, you know, grass that's a foot or foot and a half tall and it's yeah. uniform across. There is no hedgerows in the middle of a master field. No. And the reason for that is because if you get dogs in cover like that, how do you judge them? You, you can't see them. If you can't see the dogs, you can't see the birds, you can't tell what they're doing. So most of the time, master fields are grass. A, a form of grass so you can see so it's hard to reward them for covering my meat dogs or my hunting dogs you want them to go into the thickest cover they can find in the cattails and the reeds and the in the thick bushes and the hedgerows but my nastra dogs you want to be out running that grass covering the ground and so i i call them meat dogs only because they're my best pheasant dogs they don't necessarily my best nastro dogs. And and I I do both with all of them, but I have dogs that excel at one, and I have dogs that excel at the other for that reason. So that's why you gotta separate it out, Don. Because yeah. because of the cover of the habitat. Right. Um obedience score, we already talked about that real briefly. Obedience can be uh It, it, it's 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 can be punished differently by different judges and can be rewarded differently for different judges i was told when i first started out and i keep telling my wife this and she doesn't listen to me so i hope she's listening now that every time you open your mouth and make a command you put your dog at risk of not listening i am the uber overhandler <laughs> So overhandler, I overhandle and my, I can't have a hard time keep my mouth shut because I overhandle all the time and, and I get hammered for it. My dog gets hammered for it. So if you give a command to your dog and your dog doesn't response as a judge, what should you be doing? Docking that score. Okay. If a handler goes out there and the handler can point or the handler just walks to a corner of the field and the dog's looking back, finding him, how do we reward that person when they've 
they've never made any commands to their dogs. I mean, it separates it's, broke dogs from non-broke dogs real fast. Yeah. And so you have people that will yell and yell and yell and yell at their dogs and command them to be here, here, here. And if they say here five times and it does, takes five times for the dog to finally turn, there's where you get your failure to respond to the handler and you should dock the score accordingly. And plus factor is, is man, that handler tells that dog to do something and that dog does it. Where you can see um, real good obedience scores is on what we call safety birds. A lot of times we have birds that when they fly, they fly towards a judge or they fly towards another handler or they fly towards the gallery. And when that happens, the judge or the handler can call safety. Now, do you want your dog, you, you've scored that bird at that point in time. If the judge recognizes that it's a, it's a safety situation, that bird has been scored. You don't need to go get it. You don't need to produce it. If it flies out of bounds, it's, it's over, okay? Now, what happens with a lot of people's dogs is what happens is they go chasing that bird and they'll spend five minutes out of bounds. You will see a lot of handlers that when that bird flies, safety is called, they say, whoa, no bird, get over here. And that dog stops, turns, and goes back into the field. Well, there's an opportunity to see, wow, that's some crazy obedience going right there. And you can reward that behavior. Make sense? Okay. Again, here's this scoring range, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, mainly because most people don't use it. And most people don't look at it this way. If, if, if you're getting a zero to 20 in any of these things, you're probably at the point where the dog should be picked up and removed from the field. Okay, nobody usually scores a dog that poorly. It's a severe, severe problem. Something going wrong. Most scores occur between 60 and 95. I'm sorry, I stepped away. Was that obedience? That's for scoring for obedience or excuse me, 60 to 95 for fines, retrieves, and ground coverage. Obedience in backs, the scoring usually ranges from about 70 down to about 50. Now, uh, I do have to say there's been a couple times I've taken a zero obedience. Yes. You know how you can get a zero obedience? You touch your dog, you handle your dog, you grab a hold of your dog, you grab your dog and set it back because it didn't honor a back. And people touch their dogs and say, hey, you can't do that. That's a no-no in NASTA. You gotta, you gotta, if you set your dog back, I'm gonna warn you that you can't do that. If you do it again, we will remove you, but we're gonna give you a zero on your obedience because you did that. That's how you can do that. That's my okay. wife. I have a question. Yes. If your dog is backing, you are allowed, and, and the back is established, you are allowed to collar it and not be penalized, correct? You are required to collar it. Well, hold it. Right. Hold it. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yes, thanks. Yeah. You're required to collar it. But hold not it. not attach your leash. Just go walk up to your dog, put your hand. I What we do is just basically sit down next to my dog and put my hand on the collar. I'm holding the collar and there I'm petting or doing whatever I need to do to that dog at that point. Where I talk about a zero obedience as well, there's been times where I just will look at a judge and say, if my dog is completely misbehaving in the field, if I can get a hold of my dog, can I take a zero obedience just to have a conversation with my dog? That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna say, do you mind if, and, and that's within reason. I'm not, I'm, I'm saying if, if I make my dog yelp in the field or if I had somebody that I was judging made my dog yelp or, or um, like I said, it's within reason. If that's the case where it's, it's over, it's, it's over correcting in the field, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask for a bite dog. I'm going to ask you to take your dog out. I'm going to just say, you're going to be done. If I hear the dog, you're going to be done. Um, but I turn and, and just pick the dog up and I've grabbed an ear and I've set him down or I grabbed the scruff of the neck and I've set him down 
And I said, and I'll look at the judge, say, thank you, I'll take a zero obedience. And I will take a zero obedience to get yeah, my exactly. okay. That was my question. Yeah. But I ask the judge first. And, at, and when you're judging, I want that person to ask me first or they're going to get a warning. That'll be your first warning. Okay, so you can ask for permission to, to handle, like, say I suspect that something was wrong with one of my dog's paws. I can That's ask for permission? Yeah, if, if, you, if you suspect an injury or you say, you know what, I'm going to check my dog's paw out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's well within the rules. But again, with any case, anytime you want to lay your hands on your dog, just ask the judge, say, I'm going to check his feet. I'm going to, you know, yeah. I'm going to check. So in, the case, in the case of what Christy said, let's say the dog is completely falling apart. You know, it blew a point or something. You want to get your hand on him, just stand him up again. You know you're going to take a zero. You ask first. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pick my dog up and put him back for a second. Give me a zero. Is that yeah, okay? Is that gonna, if, proper? If it was a point and they're blowing the point, then what you're probably gonna you're gonna lose the bird as well. Right. Oh, for sure. For sure. But you know, you could do that. Is well, what I'm saying. Well, technically no. But if you're talking about a small regional trial where right. if right. if if Here's the way I look at it. And again, this is more a personalized view than a nationally recognized view. Here's what I will tell you is I paid my money to have my dog in this trial. If I allow that dog to have bad behavior and that bad behavior will just continue, I'm compounding the problem. If I'm willing to go in and take that dog and make the correction, and I'm willing to lose the bird, I'm willing to do all that, it's better than going in and, and having your dog become so bad that you have to pull that dog from the trial because you don't want to continue that bad behavior. And so as a handler, you got to have, or as a judge, you got to have a little bit of understanding that if it was you, would you allow your dog to continue misbehaving or would you want to be able to just correct it and say, you know what, it's not about winning this trial right now. It's about correcting my dog's behavior. And again, correcting doesn't mean physically hurting it. It means just setting it back, lowering it, doing whatever, you know, getting it under control. Now, and again, that's different in, and it's, every, it seems like every region I've gone to handles that a little bit differently. Most of them are very understanding. If your dog is out of control, where I can say, excuse me, I need to get a hold of my dog. I understand that's a zero. Is that okay? So John, yes, to answer your question, I would say, is that okay if I grab my dog? And just, I understand I'm going to take a zero for it, but is that okay just so I can stop the behavior now? Um, and, and there's a big difference between grabbing them, setting them back. It's a big thing to just get them focused, get them calm so they're not ripping birds and hurting a dog. Mm -hmm. you know, and so, and you just got to make sure you're doing the right thing. And know what region, for example, we've been in the Rocky Mountain. Now, Rocky Mountain, we finally have worked with quite a bit. But in Rocky Mountain, you couldn't even do that without just picking your dog up. Meaning you'd be, if you touched your dog for whatever, they wouldn't zero your obedience. They just ask you, they'd call in a bi dog. Well, in our region, we don't have the luxury of having 15 bi dogs if somebody has to pick up their dog. Okay, so, I'm going to go through this a little bit faster now because we're sidetracking. Right. But we'll still answer questions. Good conversations, though. That's what this is about. Yeah. So, point doesn't necessarily have to be called by the handler there are situations where a judge will go over a hill and find the dog on point the judge can call point the handler can be walking looking someplace else and the dog goes on point the judge can call point the judge can begin scoring that dog even if the handler hasn't called point that's all this basically this rule is is to say point has to be called but the judge can call point himself. And then at that point in time, the judge can advise the handler, hey, your dog's on point, come over here and, and go from there. That's all that that's saying. When the dog establishes point, you proceed to the dog and you have to flush immediately. Now, where this comes into play is people will look and see that their buddy's over there and they're going to wait around and pretend not to find the bird so their buddy can come over and get a back. 
the judge has to recognize this and say, hey, uh, you need to uh, make an attempt to get, find this bird and, and move that bird. You can't communicate to the other judge, hey, I got a dog on point, tell your handler. That, that, that's a no-no. I mean, if the other handler sees it and comes over on his own, that's great. That's what they should do. But you can't communicate as a judge, hey, I got a dog on point. Does your handler want to back? That's all this rule is saying. If the bird flushes after points called by handler, and in the judge's opinion, the dog did not cause the bird to flush, you would, as a judge, call out wild flush. Okay, what that means is, is the dog was on point, the bird got up tight, got nervous, and the bird flushed on its own. Okay, what you would do at that point in time is you would immediately tell your handler, stay where you are. Because one of the rules of mastery is, is that you can't move to make a retrieve. Once the retrieve has started, you have to remain stationary. So if, a, if you're walking up, let's say you're 100 yards away and your dog's on point, and as you're walking up, the bird just randomly pops up and jumps into the air and flies away. Your dog is standing like a statue. You're going to get credit for that fine. You just call wild flush, tell the handler, stay where you are, try to get the retreat. That handler can, on a wild flush, can attempt to shoot it if he's close enough. He can attempt to do anything he can, but he can't continue to walk. He has to wait for the retreat. Now, a lot of people say, well, you should get an average because I didn't have any opportunity to shoot that bird. Well, that's not true. Your dog can still make that retrieve on a wild flush, even if you don't shoot it. If you miss a bird or you shoot at a bird, you can even get a safety. If that bird flies where, you're a reasonable shooting distance away and it flies by another handler or a judge, you can call safety and score that as well. If the dog retrieves a bird, it will be scored. Okay. If it's a regular flush, it, you know, you make an aggressive attempt, the bird can be moved from its resting place and still be scored. Now here's where this gets really kind of crazy. So you, you're in, thick grass. The, the dog is standing like a statue. The handler goes in and the bird refuses to fly. The bird starts running around and the handler's chasing this bird around. Once the judge sees that the bird has been moved from its resting place by the handler, the bird is considered flushed. Okay? Once it's considered flush, it's a scorable fine. Even if the dog breaks at that point, because the handler has moved it from its resting place, it is considered a scorable bird. Questions with that? Okay, now, if you notice down below, a walking bird does not mean that it's been removed from its resting place. So a lot of times in a, in a trial grounds, you'll have birds that are up walking around. When they're walking around, the dog will stand there and has to hold point on it. The dog cannot run in and grab a bird just because it sees it walking around, if it's on point. The handler has to make it change directions. If the bird's walking left to right and the hand sees the handler and turns and goes the other way, the judge can say the bird is flushed. At that point in time, if the dog reacts or, or something goes on at that point, as long as the dog was remain in a pointing position until the bird is flushed, either by the judge's command or by flying, then that is scorable work. And that's all this rule is trying to talk about. If a dog is making a retreat or on point, and the 30 minute brace ends, as long as the dog does not take a step on point, they're allowed to continue one minute into overtime. If the dog, you produce that bird, let's say at 30 seconds into overtime where it flushes and flies, but it flies a long ways away. 
the dog can make the retrieve up until the full minute is expired. If the dog is not back with the bird, when that minute of overtime happens, then that dog will not get the retrieve score. That's happened to us on several occasions. In fact, my wife had it happen to her at the uh, quail invitational trial in Florida. The dog was 10 feet from being back to her in overtime and the judge said time. She was not allowed to score the retreat, even though she'd found the bird and done everything else right up until that point. So you get one minute of overtime. If the dog takes a step in overtime and you, the bird has not been flushed, the judge will ask you to pick your dog up. The dog must remain stable. There's no relocations. There's no movement allowed. Okay, if the handler doesn't reach his dog and the one minute of overtime has expired, you do not get the fine, even if there's a bird there. You have to produce the bird, you have to flush it, you have to do all that within the minute. That's the other part of this. If you unfortunately point a dead bird, you can't score. The judge may ask to see the bird. If, if your bird is near dead and looks like it's going to die, make sure you show it to the judge before you let your dog make a retreat. A lot of times what will happen is, is a, dog, a bird that's barely alive, you might look at it and say, well, it won't fly. And the judge will ask you to throw the bird for a retrieve score. Well, you pick it up and throw it, and the dog proceeds to kill it as it's bringing it back to you. If that judge gets that bird and it's dead, he's gonna say, well, you threw a dead bird. He could take that bird away from you. So if you have any doubt that the bird is alive or if it's barely alive, make sure you communicate with the judge, walk over, show it to him that it's alive and go from there. Okay. If, oh, well, and down here, if, the handler steps on a bird or kills the bird, it will not, uh, it will not uh, be scored. That's, and I've seen people do that too. Okay, we have, we have a problem in field trials where a lot of times you have rolling hills. So dogs take off off the starting line. Both judges are chasing the dogs. They come over the hill. What do they find? both dogs on point. Okay, that situation is called a split fine because nobody knows who was on point first. Do you give it to the dog in front? Do you give it to the dog behind? Do you, so what you do is both judges will say, it's a split fine. We don't know who found the bird first. They're both pointing the same bird. We don't know who got here first because we didn't see the find happen. So instead of zero to 100, your scale is zero to 50. Each dog has a maximum of 50 points to get. So you just, what, the way I do it is I say, well, I'm gonna start judging my dog from the time I do see it. And let's say I say, well, that looked like about an 80. Well, I can only score half of that. So I'm gonna give them a 40 on their fine. Do you have the video of, of uh, Bug at the- Yes, I do. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you a split fine. And the same is true on the uh, retreat. Since there's only one bird, both dogs are pointing it. What happens is, is the dog will, the dog will give the, excuse me, they will each receive half of their average retreat, but the judge will tell them, go ahead and tell one of the handlers, go in, flush this bird. Flush it, shoot it, kill it, make the retrieve, whatever. Both handlers, though, will be giving an average retreat since they, they didn't get an opportunity to score that bird. Half their average retreat. Half their average. Now, just a question on that one, Dean. The yes. one that gets to flush the bird, is the other dog automatically put in a back situation where they can collar that dog? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, in fact, that's a very good point. Yes, you want to hold, you always want to hold your dog when both dogs are pointing a bird. We want to hold one of the dogs, correct. Good question. All scored dog work must take place in bounds, okay? Well, a lot of times field trials, there's fields running side by side. 
when the fields are side by side, a lot of times dogs will see, will run out of the field and go in the other field and go on point. Can they score that bird? No, it's got to be in bounds. A dog may point a bird and the bird may walk out of bounds. Can you score that bird? Dogs inbounds, the bird's inbounds, the dog goes on point. The bird, while the handler's walking over, the bird walks out of bounds. If the judge can see that the bird was inbounds before the handler gets there, it's still a scorable bird. That is an exception, okay? The bird can walk out as long as the handler, or the judge saw it before it walked out. Then it's scorable work. Another case where it gets kind of tricky is dogs in the other field will go on point and your dog will see it and back. Can you score that? Can you back a dog from another field? No. The only dog you can back is your brace mate. However, the exception again is if your brace mate goes out of bounds and goes on point, your dog can point or back your brace mate. That's the one exception. So the basic idea is that all bird work has to be found in bounds. The backing, if the backing dog is in bounds and the pointing dog is out of bounds, the back is scored. If it's his brace mate, can't be a dog from the other field. If the pointed bird is in bounds and the pointing dog is out of bounds, it should not be scored. The bird and the dog have to be in bounds for it to be scored. Um, if the bird was out of bounds, gets accidentally flushed in bounds, can you go back and score that bird later? No, that bird would be dead for the brace because people will intentionally do that. If they find a bird out of bounds, try to flush it back in so they can score. That's, that's not allowed. If the bird flies into the bird field from out of bounds on its own, okay, it, as long as it's not flushed from the other field, or from that, the gallery. Or from the gallery. You know, somebody in the gallery scares a bird into the field or something. That bird should be dead for the brace. Okay. However, if it just randomly walks into the field, the bird should be marked for three minutes if no adjacent bird field is being involved in it. And then a marked bird, and we haven't talked about this. Let's say a dog's running along and it runs over a bird and the bird pops and flies to another part of the field. Did he point it? No. Is it scorable? No. So what you do is you do what's called, you mark the bird. The judge communicates with the other judge and says, we have a marked bird. You tell them the location of the bird. Both, both handlers have a right to know the location of the bird and both judges communicate and they will say that bird is marked and in three minutes it will be open and it'll be open at 16 minutes and 50 seconds, which if you have running time, you'll, you'll both know when that is. Then that bird is eligible to be scored after the, 30, after the three minutes. If a dog goes and repoints that bird before the three minutes, then no score is awarded and the bird must be taken out for no score. Does that make sense? Okay. If a handler or gunner walks a bird in from out of bounds, take it out for no score. Bird comes in from the other field, you can go point it if you want, but you don't get a score. If the dog is close to the out of bounds, the bird walks out and the judge sees that the bird walks out, the handler is allowed to go score the bird, the judge will score it accordingly. Those are all the things we just talked about. Um, if the bird is unable to fly, a lot of times the, the bird planner will put birds down and they don't fly, they, they're damaged, they're still alive, but they, they lose the ability to fly. They might hop three feet, not fly any further. The judge can ask the, the gunner to throw the bird. You can fire your gun if you would like. Some people train their dogs to only retrieve when a shot. So they're allowed in that case to fire their gun. 
you're not allowed to fire your gun just randomly for any other reason. You can't fire your gun to try to get your dog back to you. I know people have tried to do that. So that's another point. After an adequate attempt to flush a bird, let's say you're chasing a bird around on the ground that won't fly, you can ask the judge for permission to shoot the bird on the ground. Okay, you cannot do things like, oh, I don't want the bird to fly off, fly when I when I hand throw it. So you can't hit it over the barrel of your gun and kill it or do something like that. You have to be alive or you will lose that bird. So. Sometimes that happens. People will try to do something like that. Um, always ask, I always ask permission from the judge to do anything with picking up or handling a bird. Um, sometimes there will be some brush or thick cover, like, like small trees or a clump of bushes or something where you can't get to a bird. You can ask the judge, I see the bird, it's on the ground. And you can ask the judge to come over and look at the bird to confirm that it's there. If the judge can see it and you can't safely get in to make the bird move, you may ask the judge to shoot it on the ground. And the judge can give you permission to do that. Makes sense? It's a safety issue. You're not going to be crawling around through, through brush with a loaded gun on your hands and knees or whatever and then try to shoot a bird when it flies out of there. So that'd be the only, but again, key is ask the judge for permission. If the judge's discretion, you can get to the bird, you can make it fly, he's gonna make you do that. If a dog is in motion, if the flush occurs, now here's, here's the big, big question mark with unbroke dogs, okay? A dog sees a bird, you go in to flush, and as you're walking towards the bird, the dog breaks and goes in and they simultaneously get after the bird before you have a chance to make the bird flush. Should you score it? No, you can't score. The bird has to be moved from its resting place. So you can't reward dogs that are not steady, is what this rule is saying. If the, a dog makes a tent, the flush, you know, it, it, it's, it's the, bird, the dog has to do its job. He has to wait for that bird to be removed from its resting place. Um, a bird that is walking around when the point of career is not considered to be, at, be flushed until the handler makes the bird change direction. We already talked about that. Um, shoots. Oh, this is a situation that happens once in a while. We wanna make sure we address it. Let's say you find a bird, you shoot the bird, and your dog goes to make the retreat. The dog, you watch the, the bird die. The bird runs out there and just by coincidence runs where there's another bird and finds a live bird and grabs a live bird and brings it back to it. You saw the bird get shot and killed and here comes the dog with a live bird. Do you punish him for bringing the retreat? No. What you do is all your dog is required to do is bring you a bird. If he brings you a, if he brings you a live bird, he's doing his job. You score it. The other in the other case is true as well. If a live bird flies off, your dog goes running after it to make the retrieve, and the dog comes back with a dead, cold, stiff bird. Do you punish it? Bird. No, you don't punish it either. I mean, it's doing its job. It's making a retrieve. There's no way for a dog to know which bird he's supposed to be bringing back to you. See? The, even less happened to Dean. We were in Waverly, Nebraska last weekend and his setter, he lost sight of the bird, runs over to the dead bird barrel that's by the gallery, picks a bird up out of that dead bird barrel and brings this bird back to Dean. To be scored. To be scored. Kind of, kind of a weird situation. It's, it's only seen that happen once. Okay, what about if your dog, you send him on the retrieve for the dead bird and he picks up the live one by scent and locks into a point again. Do you handle the scenario all over again? Okay. Like I've seen it happen. Uh, great, great question, I'll give you the answer. If your dog has a bird in its mouth making the retrieve and stops and sees a live, sees a live bird or points a live bird, 
okay, with a retrieve in its mouth, you give them an average on the retrieve and you score the next fine. However, if he's on the way out to make a retrieve, finds a live bird and points it, you can't score the retrieve because he never made the retrieve happen. You can, you can get a slash because he obviously, he, you don't give him a zero. A zero is when they refuse to make a retreat. A slash is where they don't have an opportunity to make a retreat. There's a difference. So what you would, and it's, real, it's real critical to know the difference. If the dog found the bird and was bringing it back and stopped and pointed, you'll get an average on that retrieve and you start scoring the next bird. If he's on the way out, in points of live bird, you lose that retrieve, but you get the fine. See the difference? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Dean, I have a quick question. I had someone ask me once, I didn't know how to answer this. That same scenario came up. Uh, they lost the retrieve, shot the second bird, retrieved it, and then he asked the judge, Can I send my dog out for a blind retrieve to restore the first bird? Say it again. No, because no, that was uh, already over. Okay, so it's already done. You can't ask to go retrieve it after you've done your second one. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. All right, here's here's another scenario that happens. Um, you come in to flush your bird and two birds fly in the air. You turn and shoot one bird, but your dog's chasing the bird, the live bird going the other direction. Okay. As a, as a, if you're a quick thinking handler, normally you're not allowed to shoot more than one bird, but you can choose to shoot that bird the one your dog is chasing. However, if you shoot the one and it retrieves the live one flying the other direction, are you allowed to get that first score? Sure. You just have to bring back a bird. So it, it happens. Sometimes there's two birds that coveyed up. You shoot one, you see your dog's chasing the other one, so you shoot the other one, it brings that one back. You're only allowed to score one bird in those situations. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how it happens. I, it doesn't happen very often, but it has happened. Mark Bird, pretty self-explanatory. Your dog's running along and it's maybe on the wrong wind side of a bird and it runs over the top of a bird. Happens. Didn't get a chance to point it, didn't do anything wrong other than just be on the wrong side of the wind. Bird pops in the air, you, you yell, mark bird. Now, the handler has the right to call his dog off a mark bird. However, if he chases over to the bird and repoints the bird, you have to take that bird out. It's considered pointed, and anytime a bird is pointed, it has to be removed from the field. However, some dogs are broke to the flush. Your dog's running along, runs over a bird, the bird pops, flies away. If your dog stops on the flush, you're allowed to call your dog off and turn him away. That is not repointing a bird, that's stopping the flush. There's a difference. I was just going to ask that, Dean, but um, as a judge, would you actually credit that dog or stop the flush? Would you what? Credit that dog for uh, the, the flush? I would. You would. You wouldn't get the points for the scoring the fine, but what you would get is an increased obedience score. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was getting at. Yep. Yep. So, Dean, I've had this scenario happen to me, if you want to explain this. Had a dog run over the bird, bird flies to, run over the bird, bird flies to the other, you know, a little ways off, dog runs over and then points the bird. Can the handler call that bird off that point? Okay. It's the judge's discretion whether the dog should be allowed to, if, if you're talking, it pops and flies 10 feet. Mark whether, pops and flies 50 yards. If it pops and flies, I mean, it just basically pops and lands and your dog runs over and point, most judges will allow you to call it off. 
If, however, it flies any length of distance, 50, 100 yards, and your dog runs over and points it, you're going to have to take that out for a no score. And again, kind of a judge's discretion. Most of the time, it's just a pop that they'll allow you to call your dog off. Kind of a, again, if it's a, a stop to the flush situation in the judge's opinion. All right, are you guys, I gotta do something here. I've got a battery running low on a computer. So I'm gonna take a one minute break here to try to find the battery cord because I don't know where it is. So pretty good up to a five minute stretch and come back. Yep. Come back at on the half hour. Hey Natalie. Hey Natalie. Hey. No. I can't hear. I wasn't keeping track, so I'm not sure. Um, we are at 11 participants. We started with 12, so we've lost one. I'm not sure who that was. Okay. Well, I just, I only see like four or five people. That's why I was wondering. I know, honey. You have to like split your screen and then go to, instead of speaker view, go to okay. gallery view. Never mind. It's I'm up and down now. I'm still so. showing 11 participants here. Right. I have 11. Okay. Cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I'm, 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 can I just ask a question on backing before you stand up again? Yep. So as a judge, you were talking about out of birds, uh, birds that are out of bounds. Uh-huh. If you have a dog point a bird out of bounds, um, going to the backing dog, you, you mentioned that you would score that back. Is there's there's one exception to backing. Uh, one exception to all dog work must take place in bounds. And that one exception is is when your brace mate, who you're running against, points a bird out of bounds. If your dog is in bounds and back, that will be scored. However, a lot of people try to get away with it. If you have adjacent fields running side by side, and a dog goes on point in the other field. People say, my dog's backing that dog, can I screw that? The answer is no. And what I was going to get to is, as a judge, can you hold a mark where you can possibly score that if there's not another opportunity to back and use that back as a score? Nope. Nope. Okay. Just, just bad luck. Okay. Just bad luck is all. Um, you know, I'm going to actually stop right here just because I don't want us to get bored with the rules. We can go through this and, and I can give you these slides and you can go through it. But what I want to do is I want to look at some dog work for you. So I'm going to end the show for a little while. We're going to skip over to watch some dog work and we're going to talk about it because I, I, I want to keep your attention here. So we're going to look at some dogs. Do um, you remember us talking about a split find? There's situations where you come over a hill, both dogs are on point, you don't know who it is. Well, there's also situations where it, 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 if, if, if dog goes on point, even a half a step ahead of the other dog, you still give the fine to the dog that points first. However, <laughs> at a national trial, this is me running, this is in the second or third round of a national trial, they, the, the bird planner planted what's called a gallery bird. And the bird was about 30 yards off the line. Both dogs went and pointed this bird. I want you to watch this video. And I want you to tell me which dog found the bird first. And understand, I have backed this video up and played it forward, backed it up, played it forward probably 100 times. Oh, there's a lot of delay, honey. Which dog won, the setter or the Brittany? We'll do it again. Can you blow your screen up? Press Can your I? arrow. Press your arrow. There you go. And then just go. There you go. So, as you can see, I'm going to try to slow this up. We'll do it one more time. 
Tell me what stock points first. Any ideas? The one with the block. Black markings. The one with the tail or the one without a tail? The block. Without, without the tail. Okay. They, they did give it to the one without a tail, but if you look at the video on slow motion, the, the white, the, the setter had stocked at the same time. Why they gave it to the dog, the Brittany, was because the setter's tail was rising after it had stopped moving. And so it made it look like it wasn't stopped. But the reality was is that this could have easily been a split find. They did give it to the Brittany, but everybody that's watched the video has said this is a split find. Because the both dogs, their feet stopped at exactly the same time. The only thing that kept moving was the setter's tail. The only thing that was moving was the setter's tail. And you couldn't recreate that again to save your life. But those dogs, both feet, you have re I've rerounded seven, I don't know how many times. And the, those dogs' feet stop at exactly the same time. So does, does calling point by the handler have any play in that? Because I've been in a scenario where two dogs were really birdy. The handler called point, but his dog hadn't actually quite stopped yet. Okay, good, good, good question. And it, number one, it's unethical. Number two, you're trying to influence the, the judge. We have a handler that's notorious for calling point because his dog keeps stepping and keeps creeping. So he calls point. And one of the, the nuances of our game is, is that once you've called point and your dog has established point, you as a handler is allowed to woe your dog. So what this handler does was will call point before the dog has stopped moving and then start woeing his dog thinking he's getting away with it. And he's actually had birds taken away from him. And for an unseasoned brand new judge, it's real easy to get influenced by that. Right. So it, it's, yes, it does happen and no, it shouldn't happen. It's, a dog has to stop so you can call point. And then if it starts moving, you can mow it. Okay. Unfortunately, we have a lot of seasoned, real seasoned dog handlers that will find any way they can to try and get away with that. Stuff like that. Especially when you know your dog real well, when you know what your dog's going to do. And so it, they kind of manipulate the rules that way. All right. I'm going to show you some just some out training videos of some old dogs. And when you watch it, now remember, an average fine is, let's say, let's use 75. Um, John, we're going to ask that you score this bird work here. And I want you to look for plus factors and I want you to look for minus factors. So you're going to be on speaker, John. Turn on your mic. You're, the pressure's on you. Um. So you're going to score this. You're going to tell me what you see. Well, oh, it's real choppy though, Dean. But anyway. Did it load? Did it load on your screen? Yeah, I'm watching. That was a good find. I heard. So I would start at 75, you're saying, is the number? Yeah. Shit, I can't see any calls. I mean. Okay. Now, that's just it. Now, what we got to do is we got to back up, John. So what you're looking for as a judge is when did that dog make scent? And when did that dog stop after making scent? If you, if you go back. Okay, go ahead. Go back. You, if you go back, you can tell that the dog makes scent long before it stops. Go ahead, play it. Do you see that? Oh, uh, you said whoa too, right? After it stopped, after it stopped. But did you see how, how long after it made scent before it took to finally stop? Yep. Okay, so the, you got to be looking for that. 
because the dog in theory, as soon as you can tell it smells that bird, you should have, you should have stopped. Huh. Okay. So I, I intentionally showed you this first because that's the kind of things you got to pick out. When does this dog smell this bird? Does it stop immediately? Say that again. See, I'm almost inclined to say he called woe before he woed the dog, unless unless it's choppy. No, no, it was it was the woe came the woe came after. Okay. But do you see where the dog made scent but kept walking in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that that is that is a case where it wasn't flashy. Now the reason I showed you this one is because you have some some room to to uh, downgrade it. I'm going to show you another one now. Same scenario. I want you to score it. Oh no. What do you see? Do you see him tenderly or not? Uh, no. No. Do you see him flagging the whole time? Huh? Yeah. 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 I was going to say it was a mess, but if you're going to replay it again. Yeah, I'm going to replay it. It's he's flagging. He's not intense. He looked back for his handler. You don't see the intensity. I'm going to play it at the beginning again here. It gets real choppy though, Dean. Oh no. Yeah. So would that be, you know, if I was starting at 75, would that be like a 60 or like okay, so, an idea, Dean? So I you you're you're on the right track. You've got a dog that's flagging. You got a dog's looking around. He's not very intense, but at the end here, he does firm up a little bit. But now he took a step. Did you see the step? Yeah, I didn't see the step because it's choppy, but okay. So that'd be two points right there, right? Yeah. Now the bird has been shot. I gotta do this for it wasn't a direct retrieve. Do you see how it kind of circled around? I wasn't, no, it was a little choppy. I was going to ask you to describe it to me, but okay. Okay, yeah, it didn't come in directly. It circled around. Okay. I apologize. Some of our feeds are a little slow. So he didn't drop the bird or anything? He it, just circled around? It struggled to pick it up. Okay. So. So again, on the retrieves, if we're starting, I'm going to use that 75 as a number, correct? Yes. So I was, it was, it didn't directly bring the bird back. It uh, didn't pick the bird up quickly. It, it had some faults. Now, I want to show you another fine, and I want to show you one that you can score a little differently. So hold on, Dean. What would you have scored that retrieve, that last one? I would have probably scored it around a 70. 70, okay. 70, 65, 70. Okay. Did you watch this? No, go, go back. Yeah, perfect. Right? 75? Oh no. No. Oh, that's a 90. I was going to say, I would say 85 at least. Yeah. Oh, that's because you're okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Because he's running by the bird, Donnie yeah. hits scent and just locked her right up. Locked up, so you're going out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He's okay. running. She's, this dog is running hard in the opposite direction. It goes ass to tea kettle, spins around, snaps, doesn't step, doesn't move. It's very stylish. This is, this is an 88, 90. Right, yeah, beautiful. Do you see how you got to be looking? You got to leave room for this score compared right, to right. one that showed you before. 
and then watch the retrieve. And I'm sorry, the video goes sideways. There's the bird. Look at how fast she grabs it. Look at how fast she comes back once she gets it. And brings it right back. Very snappy, very high scoring, that kind of thing. I have a question. Yes. So uh, in, in the, all the videos that you've shown so far, I'm hearing a lot of uh, talking. Even on this one that was very stylish, on the retrieve, I'm hearing here, here, bring it here. Mm -hmm. uh, are we still getting full marks? Are we, moving, are we losing some marks in obedience on these? Or is that allowable? That's very allowable. Most people do not punish you because most people have some kind of command for their dogs to come in. I, I've, I've never seen a judge punish a handler for repeating a command like here, 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 here. We, like we, we, would okay. punish a, we would punish a handler that was doing that and the dog was heading out somewhere else. This dog was coming directly back. I wouldn't, I wouldn't penalize I would agree. If the dog head towards the other so, hand. So, okay. So in Navda, I'm a Navda judge. So in Navda, you're allowed the one here on the, on the pickup. Yep. Yep. And that's and it. I, then I, you're I, quiet. That's where that was coming from. It's, as long as they're doing what they're supposed to, I think I agree exactly with what Don said. If they're running off and you're having to say it, it's different than if they're then coming that, back to you and you're doing it just out of habit. Right, right. Okay. That's, that's more of a Great too question. much talk yeah. and not enough quiet. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And Very I do the same question. thing sometimes and Dean even yells at me, but still you can without punishment. If my dog snaps and they're on point, I'll say, whoa. And it's just a matter of me reassuring to me. I feel like it, even though they're holding point like here, I'd be saying, whoa, I might say, whoa, just to keep him reminded to hold steady. Now that's not a downgrade. So right. it's so as you're walking past them. So this dog's on point. You're walking past to go to do the flush. As you're going past, it's okay to say whoa. Yes. Now keep in mind, when you get to a national level, the judges are looking for anything to, dis to differentiate between the quality of the dog work. If you don't have to say it, they're probably going to give you a little better score than if you're doing it. Not so less is more. Less is more. Okay, Dean, thank you. I just have one question as well. Um, I hate to go backwards and don't pull the video up. That first dog you had, John, score. Yes, sir. I noticed that dog picked up scent as it came around the handler. Um, looking at it, to, from my point of view, it almost looked like the handler marked the bird for the dog. Is that well, something you look for as a judge? Well, it, it, that, in that video, I would understand that, except the handler was actually the lady. The guy that was with the gun was just waiting for the handler to show up because he was the gunner. She didn't shoot. So if you would have thought the man was the handler, I would agree with you. Now, that brings up a good point. Can a handler see a bird on the ground on his own walking and call his dog into that bird? Yes. Of course. Of course. Yes. Okay. You can see a bird walking around. Can you call your dog over to kind of work that bird? Of course mm. you can. You can't wool them. But you can say, here, 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 here. Bird here. Bird here. Come over here. Just and a hint. Make sure that you are downwind. Yeah. My wife is... My wife has a tendency to see birds on the ground and bring them in upwind and can't understand why the dog flushes the bird or runs it over. But that's a whole other thing. That's a personal problem that we've dealt with before. But I wasn't going to say it, honey, but I'm glad you brought it up. But John, Josh, that was, yes. If uh, you thought that was a handler, then yes, he could have probably considered that. But keep in mind, like I said, I didn't score that dog very well because I could tell it centered the bird long before it finally stopped and pointed. I want to show you this one. Do you remember? Do you remember seeing this dog earlier where it was flagging and no intensity? And okay, there is a bird on the ground. This dog is standing stylish, high head, high tail. This bird is walking. And if you look where that yucca plant is, 
you're going to see that bird walking. You're going to see the dog's head following the bird walking, and you'll eventually see the bird walk right in front of this dog. Again, as you're a judge and you're scoring this, I want you to keep all this in mind. If you, he's watching this bird walk right now. And if you look in those bushes to the left of the screen, you're actually going to see the bird here, right there. You see him, the bird moving? It's going to come walk in front of the yucca plant yeah. right now. Here, here it comes. And it's going to see it walking right there. And unfortunately, he steps in some cactus on the retreat, so he ends up picking up his paw. All right. Now, Josh, as a judge, you're looking at that whole body of work right there. Is there any pluses? Is there any minuses? What do you see? The video is pretty choppy on my side, but I like the way the dog handled the bird. He didn't. He didn't stop. Once you establish point, okay. I don't see any way to knock them. I'd probably score them around an 80. Okay, plus factors, high head, high tail. He's holding a walking bird. You got a walking bird four or five foot away from the front of his nose. Show sign that the dog is broke very well, right? Obedience score is a factor as well. There's a lot of dogs in this game that can't hold a walking bird. So from that standpoint, obviously we didn't see the initial fine because it, we just didn't get there to video it, but there's a lot of plus factors at the end of the fine that we were able to see. You know, I, it, I can't give you a total score, but I saw three or four things that were plus factors right at the end of that fine. Does that make sense? Being, being that walking bird, that right, right, just shot a score up, no? That right, drive, drives the score up. Yep. Because there's a lot of dogs will see a walking bird and rip it out. And you'll lose that score. I'm going to show you, I'll just show you. I was at the uh, endurance this year and we had the pre-trial, which is going on before. And uh, I was exercising my dogs. I'd been judging all day. And so I only had the opportunity to let my dogs out. Um, I hate to interrupt. Do you remember when we did this a couple days ago, there was a way to up do your videos so they didn't, they weren't so choppy? I don't. I think it has to do with the quality of the video feed from here. Right. I, th I, I just don't think maybe Natalie's internet is as good as, but. All right. Here's, awesome. this is just kind of a fun video. So I happened to have my dogs out and one of my dogs went on point. And one by one, all six of my dogs locked up on the same bird. So we kind of had them surrounded. Kind of feels like Custer here. Kind of the battle of the big horn. Hey, I, I don't know if in Canada you know about Custer's last stand. He was surrounded yeah, by the Indians and got yeah, yeah. We get, we get that to school. <laughs> but do you see this bird walking? And there's six dogs on point. The running joke is who's going to break first? Now what? And I intentionally walked this bird over towards Old Steady because I knew she wouldn't do anything. So the only reason I'm showing you that is because remember, you want to look for a way to differentiate between really good broke dogs and dogs that barely know how to do this game. And one of the things you can do on a find is you can find pluses to drive them up. 
questions on that? You guys so, like so, so what would you have scored then, the last video? Not your dogs, but the, uh, the dog on point that didn't, that didn't move. The, the one that's not his pick. The yeah, one that's the, kicked. Yeah. Well, it's real hard because we didn't get to see the beginning, Julie. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't, I mean, from the tail end, if all I had to go on was the tail end, it would be a really good score. Like an 85? 90? Yeah, at least. Okay. Because you just, I, think, I think the biggest thing to remember is you can't score what you can't see. So if I were to come over a hill and see a dog like that, and I can only score what I was able to see. So that's going to be, if, if I didn't see the beginning, that's going to be a hell of a fine score. I mean, score, because I didn't get to see but So I got to score what I got to see, which was that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, uh, you got to see the whole find in order to uh, answer some of those questions. Um, now, Let's go back to, remember I talked about the quality of a back? Whoa. Back. Did the dog stop immediately? No. Is the dog super intense? No. The plus factor is, is look at the distance. You know, he, he's, he's making a back from a long ways away. But did you see when the handler got there, he's wagging his tail and he's kind of looking around. It, and I wish I had a Stevie back on here for you to see compare. Dean, unless the video's really choppy, I'm going I'm to be inclined to say uh, the handler woed the dog on the back. That's a zero. If That's he did, what I'm yeah, here. yeah. You're getting the, obviously you're getting the audio before the, oh, the okay. yeah, the rest. Okay. Okay. He is, he is. Yeah. Whoa. And then back. Yeah. Well, you're supposed to call back first. You're absolutely right. But the dog had already stopped. So you would warn. Okay, so it must be the video. It must be the video. Yeah. You would warn the handler. Now watch the dog here. See him looking at the handler. See him looking around, wagging its tail. Yeah. Okay. A lot of negative factors. One plus factor, only one plus factor of the whole deal was probably the distance of the back. A lot of dogs will run in and close that distance up. But there's several negative factors. If I were to score that back, remember 75 is, is a good, is perfect back score. Yeah. I would score that back there, you know, 45, 50 range. Okay. Now, in the case that if I was right in the video and they, they said, whoa, before back, that's a zero, right? Yep. That's absolutely. No absolutely. Okay. Yep. And that's why. Even as the dog was creeping in to if, slow down, they say, whoa, that's still zero because they haven't fully yep, stopped. They haven't established the back yet. Absolutely right. Good question. I want you to pay attention to the, the retrieve. Hopefully it's not choppy, John. There you hear me saying, whoa, whoa, which is just a habit of mine, bad habit. She doesn't need to because the dog ain't moving. And a judge will dock her for that. 
You see the enthusiasm and the intensity on the retrieve? Yep. And see, good to me. That's a quality retrieve. There's very intense, it's straight out, it's aggressive, it comes back, it's right to the hand. There's there's no that that's a very good retrieve. So what would you score that retrieve? Uh probably an eighty-five. Again, when does the dog scent the bird? versus when does it stop? Do you see see how poor that work took is? Steps. Took some steps, right? I mean, it's choppy again, but. Okay, well, the thing of it is, is no, you didn't take steps because it never established point. Usually when you say it takes steps after they establish point. Right, I meant he kind of creeped in more to, to get that final point. <laughs> Yeah, it's so that the word you're looking for is roding in, John. Okay. It roded in on the fine. If you take steps, it means you've established point and then took steps. In this case, she never, this dog never moves until after or up until it established points. It's, it roded in on this bird. You could tell it smelled this bird from a long, long mm -hmm. ways. And, and I'll redo it. You can tell it smelled it from a long ways away, but it refused to stop until it was right on top of it. This should not be rewarded in a school. Hey, there it's already on. There it's already on sand. Do you see that? It had smelled this bird a long time before it finally stopped. He does sometimes and sometimes he doesn't. And that's why this dog is no longer a trial dog. But I just thought I'd add that. But it's a great wild bird dog, but it's no longer a trial dog. Right. Because it does this all the time. It roads in, it runs in, it keeps moving. And I couldn't... I mean a dog like that, Bond, and a CKC, AKC, that's that's a very good find, right? I mean, it's totally different. If if all you saw was this part, you'd say, "Oh man, look at the intensity! Look at the find." On a CKC run, John, I probably would have docked him on knowing that he had hit sand earlier. Oh, absolutely. Okay. okay. Not absolutely. not a lot, but he would have. He definitely wouldn't be. You know, he'd probably be be down into the maybe high eighties. And if it was no, an FDX, and, and if it was an FDX, Sorry, John. If it was an FDX John. Test, hold on, one person at a time. Who's asking? I was just saying to John, if it was an FDX, I was just gonna ask you. They would have failed right away because he woed the dog. Yep. Now, did you notice that retrieve? The dog was chomping the bird. The dog sat there and chomped the bird. The dog circled around the handler. The dog dropped the bird. All kinds of negatives. All kinds of negatives on that retrieve. No, nope, that's the one we just did. Apologize. That same one. Oh, we did that one as well. Okay. So I want to show you a couple of actual. Now it's time to get back into the action with round three. Footages here. I'm going to jump ahead to some things I want you to see. All right. 
there is a liver short short hair that didn't back. And I want you to watch how this goes down. So the handler comes in. He's, he's supposed yep. to grab a hold of his dog and hold it. Even if he zeroes the back, which in this case he did zero. But you see the dog run away from him? Now you've got to do some obedience deductions as well. Not only did he zero the back, now he's running away from the hand. Now, here's the part. Now, here's the part that bothers me. This is at a national trial. That handler grabbed his dog and let his dog off. He's not supposed to do that. And this is you don't think it was called to? Say again? You don't think it was called to for, so the other guy can get the shot and everything? Well, the, judge take the judge can ask him to move his dog. Yeah. But he just grabbed his dog. He's mad at his dog, so he just grabbed his dog and drove oh, him out. Okay. Okay. You can ask for permission from the judge, and sometimes the judge will tell you to take your dog out. Right. But you can't just go up and do it on your own. And this is one of those, I don't even know how to say this politely, but this is one of those good old boy situations where the guy that did it has been around forever, and he just does shit like this and doesn't ask for permission. I don't know. And it, it's disappointing because it's not right. So he had had a zero on backing, he right? A zero on the back. And you hit him in obedience as well. And you hit him in obedience as well. Correct. Dean, maybe you could go over um, a dog comes in the back and the handler with the find asks for a relocate. What are your options as a judge of the backing dog? Okay. So that's part of the, that's, let's, that's going back. That's part of the rules that we need to uh, make sure everybody knows. So dog comes in, other dog goes on the back. All right. The handler that has the pointing dog starts looking for the bird. The judge of the backing dog puts the backing dog on the clock. He's on the clock for three minutes. So what happens is, is if I'm if I'm judging the backing dog, I look at my time, and I'm going to keep keep track of three minutes. The handler of the pointing dog can look for the birds for two minutes. Two minutes of those three minutes, he can look for the bird. What happens at that point in time is you have to relocate your dog. The pointing dog has to be relocated if the bird hasn't been produced after two minutes. If the dog relocates and goes back on and establishes point, you, the, the backing dog has to be held for another minute. The handler will continue to look for that bird and try to produce it. So now three minutes is gone. We still haven't produced the bird. The judge of the backing dog can tell that handler of the backing dog, he can say, you can take your dog and lead him out of the area or you continue to hold, it's your choice. The handler says, I'm gonna lead my dog out. So he grabs his dog and leads his dog a reasonable distance away, 10, 15 feet in the other direction. He can release his dog and if his dog runs off and goes hunting, He's scored his back, he's met his obligation, and he can go off and start hunting. No matter how long that dog keeps looking for that bird, on uh, the other dog keeps looking for that bird on point. You've met your obligation, after three minutes you're off. However, if your dog spins around and goes back on a back, you're stuck there for another three minutes, and we do it all over again. Does that make sense? Yep. You're holding a backing dog. Two minutes go by. The other, the, the, the other judge has to tell the handler to relocate his dog. He relocates, takes four or five steps, goes back on point. 
He keeps looking for the bird for another minute, can't find it. You tell the backing dog, you're allowed to lead your dog off if you like. If the dog, guy knows his dog won't leave, he, can, he won't be able to, he'll just say, no, I'll sit here and wait. You have that option to sit there and hold your dog in the back or to lead them off. However, if you lead them off and they turn around and re-point or re-back, then, you, then you're forced to hold them for another three minutes. You can't choose to lead them off right away again. You're stuck there for another three minutes. Does that, your, is that what you wanted me to explain? Yeah, that's exactly right. Just from a handler's perspective, yep. once you get that first back, you certainly don't want to go in for another one because you're just burning valuable time. Right. Oops, not pulling out on you to see. All right. I want you to watch this situation here. So you're going to have a dog come in and go on point. You're going to have the other handler who's in the picture see this dog on point. He's going to lead his dog in or call his dog in for the back. Now, one of the things that you have to differentiate as a judge is if the dog that's coming in for the back is in the scent cone, you can't score the back because the dog, you don't know if the dog is scenting the bird or backing the other dog. So when you watch this develop, you can see which, which way the pointing dog is pointing. Then you need to watch the backing dog. Now, the only discrepancy is, is the backing dog comes in from heavy, heavy grass. And you have to, as a judge, decide, do I give him this back, even though he's in the scent cone, and he just suddenly saw the dog, or did he smell the dog when he, when he backs? So you, I'm going to let this play out, and then we'll talk about it. You can see the handler in the background calling this dog in, trying to get him to come in for a bath. Hey, Glenn, can you make that video a little bit bigger? Did it play out? Everybody see it? Yeah, can you make the video a little bit bigger? Is that possible? Yeah. Thank you. I'll do it. I'll do it again here. Maybe that causes it to jump too much. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. So think, go ahead. I think the confusion is the dog looked at first, started to make a second step. I think he caught scent and then stopped. And I've had people look at this video. I, I, I'm glad, you, you know, you're, you're seeing that. That's why you got to watch close as a judge. I've had people tell me that it came wow. through that heavy cover and it was only after it cleared the heavy cover that it saw the dog. I think it saw the dog first and had opportunity to stop and didn't wait until it caught scent. Okay. So as a judge, you're faced with this kind of stuff all the time. What, and and you, you try to be fair to the dog. You usually give the dog the benefit of the doubt. You have three choices as a judge. You can say no. The dog saw the, the backing dog saw the other dog and didn't stop until it was in the scent cone. So I'm zeroing it. You're going to say the dog stopped, didn't see the dog, and as soon as it saw it, it stopped. Or you can say the dog only stopped in the scent cone, I'm zeroing. Or you can do the last thing, you can say, I'm not really sure what happened. 
I'm going to give you another opportunity. So you have three choices. You can zero the back, you can score the back, or you can tell the handler, I'm going to give you another opportunity because I'm not sure. If the dog came straight in from downwind and ran straight up to get to this point, then I would say it scented the bird. But when they come from the side and it ran through heavy cover, I could see somebody saying it didn't see the bird. You always have that, you always have that option to say, you know what? I'm not really sure if it smelled it. You're not allowed to score it if it scented the bird instead of backing the dog. So you, in this case, if you if you're wishy-washy, you always have the option to say, "I'm going to give you another opportunity because I'm not sure." Never nine, nine never. times out of ten, that's going to wash itself out anyway. If it, if that's what happened in this case, it's probably going to happen in the next one as well. <laughs> in you, you, a handler's never going to like the third decision. Trust me. I'll give you another opportunity. I'm not sure if I'm going to give you that back. Unless they know they're, unless in their mind, and some handlers are pretty honest, and that's in their mind, they know that their dog smelled it. They're like, oh, good, I get another chance. Or if they like, some of them will argue with you that, oh my gosh, I, the dog didn't see it until it cleared that brush. You know? but they, Just to add something to that, Dean, if you don't mind. Um, Looking at it from my angle, the dog's in, a, in the typical back. There's no intensity or anything like that. I also wouldn't punish the dog for the handler bringing them around downwind of the bird. I, like, this, this is an opportunity where I feel I'd give the dog another chance to see if it does the same the thing. Again, again, but that was more, in my opinion, handler error. And the dog might get punished for that. And I was just, I, you brought up a very good point. That, that's, that's handler air to bring the dog in from that spot. I agree totally. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's where I was going to finish this conversation is if you know that that dog is downwind, why would you bring it in to that spot? Because you know it's going to be a judge's decision whether you're going to get that score. Don't bring your dog in downwind. Bring your dog in from the side or from the front. Then, then it takes that judge's discretion totally out of the picture. So, yes, I, I agree with you. But do you see how it can be real difficult to, you know, make a de decision like that? Now it's time to get... Oh, I know which one I want to show you. Hold and on. And even the birds don't. What's that? Welcome. To I didn't hear what you said. Hang on. The video I want you to see is coming up. You better get to it here. Oh, I hate to even show you this because this is me, but it's going to, I'm going to show you a bad dog work here. This is a dog relocating on its own. I got to do it again because I missed it. Dog goes on point here, moves, stops, relocates again, moves, stops. I come in to flush the bird, moves again, stops. Okay, 
the dog at established point relocated on its own established point again relocated on its own established point again by the time this dog got done moving and you score this bird there's hardly enough left to score relocation is a severe severe punishment you don't want dogs relocating on their own don't keep saying that that's my dog i know that's, that's kind of my first cow dog i've ever owned in my life there's a perfect example of me being brand new and not fixing my dog in the field when I first owned the dog, when she was a puppy, because I didn't know any better. And now it's such a habit, she just does it. If she can't see it, she'll relocate every time. Okay, I want you to find this dog. Watch this dog. <laughs> It established point and then took three steps. Now it's looking around. Okay, if you see that video, the dog established point and then took three steps. Otherwise, it probably would have scored exceptionally well. Again, the dog smelled the bird long before it stopped. It waited till it had it right under its nose before it finally locked up. You can't score it real high. You can't, it wasn't, it was, you know, maybe more average than anything. Would you say they were in the 50 to 60 range then for scoring? That one? Yeah. No, I would say I would say uh, low 70s, high 60s. Okay. okay. But four re relocations on that little Brittany, 50s, high 40s. Yeah. With three low. That's, that's the one I was referring to. Yeah. Oh, no, I was thinking the last one. No, that one. Yeah, that was that was forties or fifty. I think he, she scored like a forty-two or something. Okay. Hey, yeah. Dean, Jeff, and Sean here. Yes. Um, do the judges typically come in that close and that quickly on those bikes? Hey, good question. One of the one of the problems is. There's such inconsistency across the country. If you have a dog standing there and the judge walks into heavy cover and starts kicking around at the bird and all of a sudden the bird, the dog jumps in and then you see the bird pop. Now, did the dog move before the bird was moved? Or did the judge actually, or did the handler actually move the bird enough but the bird just didn't fly that the dog saw that and ran in to grab it. So you get judges across the country that will stand back a long ways away and you, you're faced with the dilemma, well, did that dog move and take out that bird or did the handler move it? You'll get at a national trial and a lot of times the judges are going to want to see the bird move themselves. So they will get a lot closer at a national trial. Number one, because most of the dogs at a national trial are better broke and the judges don't bother the dogs. But at a regional weekend trial, most of the judges will stay further away because there's a lot of amateur dogs that are that tend to get unraveled easier and you, you, it, it kind of just depends on the circumstance. Hey, okay. Jeff, I can tell you from my perspective, when I started in Astra, uh -huh. and my dogs are FDX, FDA, I run walking at horseback trials at CKC, the, the judges coming in on the quad or following the dog on a long cast really 
was a lot of pressure on my dogs. I actually had to come back home and start working the dog around quads, you know, getting them to point and literally driving up to them. That was just a whole nother process that we had to add because that is a lot of pressure on a pup that's never seen that before when you're on point and all of a sudden a four-wheeler comes flying across the prairie and stops Very 30 good. feet away, right? Unbelievably yeah. good point. Unbelievably good point. So let me clarify something. I tell all my judges when I get done with a session, I said, your judging technique is just as important as, uh, as uh, the person that you're judging. You don't get between the handler and the dog. You judge from the side. You don't, trade, you don't chase a dog out into the field. You get to the side. If you end up getting between the handler and the dog, you tend to force the dog away from the handler and they can't control their dog. You always judge from the side. When you're scoring a dog, a lot of times you see this with, with rookie judges is the bird will get handed to the handler. Your job is to immediately go over and grab that bird. You'll see a lot of judges start to write their score down. The handler's walking off with the bird because you're over there writing your score down. You got your head down. In the meantime, what's the dog do as soon as he hands that owner the bird? He takes off. He's gone. I have seen so many judges lose the dog because they're busy with their head down writing the score down. There's time to, to write that score down after, but that judge needs to follow that dog. And what happens is when a dog hands a bird to its handler, that dog will nine times out of 10 just immediately turn and take off. And if there's any kind of hills or ravines or whatever, you'll lose your dog while you're writing that score down. You got to find time to write that score down. You got to get the bird from the handler because you don't want a bird walking around, a handler walking around with a bird in his hand. So as soon as that handler gets the bird, you ride over there, you grab that bird, and you immediately start tracking that dog. While you're chasing that dog, be thinking about your score. What were the pluses? What were the minuses? What did I like? What did I didn't like? You'd be running that score through your head. That way, if the dog doesn't look like it's going over a hill or doesn't look like it's going to be lost from sight, then you can stop and write your score down. But so many rookie judges, even experienced judges, will immediately write the score down. The handler's walking off with a bird in his hand, which he doesn't want, he can't have, and you've lost the dog because you got your head down, okay? You just got to be thinking that the second that bird's handed to that person, they're taking off. So you, you got to be ready to react. But the big mistake you're talking about is judges chasing dogs away from the handlers. And, uh, it, and believe it or not, I hate to even tell you this, but it is a sometimes a very deliberate tactic by judges that are judging somebody when their friend's running in the other brace. They will intentionally drive the dogs off from the handler. I've seen it happen. I hate to say that, but I've seen it happen. Answer the question. Did that yeah, answer? Yeah, I think that, uh, that answers it. Thanks. Okay. All right, I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of this and just make sure we understand, because this is the judging portion again. Um, if a dog points a marked bird before the three minutes is up, you got to take it out. Cannot be, a, a dog cannot be let off a pointed bird, and if they are marked, they ha all pointed birds have to be taken out. A stop to flush, we already talked about that. If a bird's running, a dog's running along, a bird pops and the dog stops to flush, you're allowed to call that dog off and that bird will become marked. If a judge is riding along and you see a bird on the ground and you think you're the only one that sees it, do you need to notify anybody and call it a marked bird? No. However, if you see the marked bird and you know the handler sees the marked bird, you can't create an unfair advantage. It's what I keep saying marked bird. If you see the bird, and the, and the handler sees the bird, let's say it pops off the ground and flies 10 feet. 
you and your handler see that bird. Is it fair to the other handler if you don't say anything? No. So you have to mark it if you know that the handlers see it. Okay, so that's how you make the decision if you're gonna mark a bird or not. If you're driving along on your bike and you just happen to see it and nobody else is around, the handler's ahead of you, none of the other, the other handlers isn't around, you just don't say anything, you leave it there. If you see a bird fly in from the other field, now it's, you have to notify the other handler and judge and say, there's a bird that came in from the other field. It's dead for the brakes. And they said, well, how do I know there isn't a bird over there? You identify it as a two bird area. You say, you can go over there. And if you find a bird, the first one doesn't count. You have to find two birds in order to score one, because we know one of those birds came from the other field. So it's called a two bird area. You will communicate with your other judge and say, hey, a bird flew in from the other field over here in this corner. It is considered a two bird area. That bird is dead for the brace. So if a handler goes in there and finds a bird, that first bird is dead for the brace. If he finds a second bird, he can score that second bird. Okay. All right, the other thing that will happen is you'll have what's called a scored on bird. If a handler flushes a bird, call safety. Okay, that bird has been scored. He's gonna get an average on his retreat. He may call his dog off and say, come on, let's go. And they go a different direction. What if that scored bird stays in the field? Can the other handler come over and score it? No, it becomes a two bird area. You call the other judge and say, we have a two bird area over here in this corner. There's a scored on bird and you identify where it is and you, the other judge will tell his handler where the two bird area is. We have a scored on bird. Again, same scenario. If some handler goes over there after that, the first bird won't be scored. The second bird will be scored. Pretty self-explanatory. A judge basically shouldn't allow a bird to be scored more than once in a brace. If they're paying attention where scored on birds are, where mark are birds from other fields flying, they won't allow that to be. If a scored on bird is in the field and the handler is close, he at his own discretion may ask the guy, can you just go take that bird out so nobody tries to score it again? Okay, you, what, what'll happen is if the, if the handler doesn't have anything going, he doesn't have a lot of birds, he might do it just because it's good training for his dog. He might refuse to do it because he's in the middle of a good run. He doesn't want to waste time pointing a bird that he can't get any points for. You can ask him to do it. He doesn't have to do it. Interference. If a dog's on point, another dog comes in and steals point, takes the bird out. As long as the pointing dog doesn't move, you're going to get to score that fine. Okay. And in fact, the interference of that nature will raise your obedience score tremendously. And it should raise your fine score because your dog withstood all kinds of pressure. If a dog touches you while it, you're on point, another dog touches you, that is automatic interference. However, where the discrepancy lies is, is if another dog's, a dog's on point, the other dog comes in and together they move and take out the bird. Now, you don't get to score that bird. It's one of the most controversial decisions in NASTRA. If both dogs are deemed to be moving when the bird flushes, even if your dog is on point, the other dog comes in, races ahead of your dog, and then they both move and the bird flushes, you can't score that bird. Your dog has to remain rock steady, solid, until the interfering dog makes the bird flush. Again, judges call.
a dog is fighting, judge can ask a dog to be picked up. Uh, if a dog takes out two birds, they're going to be asked to be removed from the field. The first bird that a dog grabs and takes out, it goes on point and grabs it and takes it out. You give that person a warning. Bird's not scored. That dog, that dog has a warning. The second time it does it, you stop the clocks. You stop the brace. You bring in a buy dog. Your asset got handler to leash up his dog and lead it out of the field. And you'll get a replacement dog to finish. You can't let one dog run a field un without competition. It's not fair to the other braces. You always have to finish a brace with two dogs in the field. If a dog runs out of bounds for 10 minutes, you stop the brace. The other handler hold, leashes up his dog. You find a by dog, you bring the by dog into the field. You can't let one dog run unopposed at any time for any reason. You always have to have two dogs in the field. The by dog can be a dog that's already run that doesn't have a placement. A by dog could be a dog that's not on that field. Could be a you know just some dog. Once it's a dog has been DQ'd, the dog coming in is going to get treated like it's being scored, even though it's not being scored. You have to make it fair for the dog that's still in the field to have somebody to run against because it's not fair to all the, the rest of the dogs. Um, a warning is given on the first infraction, the dog is picked up after the second. A dog that flush birds on their own after, before or after point will be given a warning, picked up after the second. If a bracemate comes in an area and moves ahead of the pointing dog and points, and then the pointing dog leaves the fine or breaks point, the bird should be taken out for no credit. You can't have a dog on point, another dog comes in and interferes, and that dog says, oh, and it gets intimidated and leaves. Can the other dog score that fine then because it intimidated the other dog? No. It can't score it. The other dog loses the fine. The dog has to be just shot and removed from the field. If, the, if a bracemate fails to back a pointing dog and moves in front, but does not point the, board, the, the bird, and the pointing dog then breaks, and together they take out the bird, this is where it gets iffy. There's no interference because both dogs are considered to a broken point. No points are scored. No find is given. However, if the bracemate touches the pointing dog, Interference is awarded, score the fine, and you get the average retrieve. Because usually a dog that interferes will also take the retreat. If that dog rips out the bird and brings it back to its owner, you can't score a retreat. So you will get an average. Dog must retrieve a bird to within three feet. You're allowed to take one step to reach a bird. Anything more than one step and you get a zero, you, you do not get the retrieve. The handler can ask to step out of heavy cover or brush so the dog can see him, but you have to ask the judge to do that. Um, should the retrieving dog, we talked about this, should the retrieving dog go on point during the course of a retreat? The key point is it has to have the bird in its mouth. You'll get an average score on the retrieve and you'll get to score the next bird. If you're on the way out to make the retrieve, then no, you're not. You won't get the retrieve. If a dog is broke to wing and shot, here's a rules interpretation. You have dogs that are broke to wing and shot. The handler, normally when you shoot, the dog breaks, goes and brings the bird back to you. If the dog is broke to wing and shot, that means that dog's gonna stand on point until the bird hits the ground. The handler is allowed to walk over on that case and release the dog to go get the retreat. Again, it's, it's a sign of another step of obedience. You can reward the obedience score on dogs that are broke to wing and shot. It's not required in our game, but it is a sign of real good obedience.
If the judge sees more than one bird, they must remain marked for three minutes, whether regardless of whether or not the bird takes flight. You're, you're come along and you see a dog go on point and you stand there as a judge and you see two or three birds on the ground. The, the handler is allowed to go in and score one bird. The other two are marked birds. The one or two are marked birds and remain marked for three minutes. You can only score one bird at a time. Okay, only one bird can be shot and less and scored. If the gunner is unable to shoot a bird in danger of hitting individuals, the animal, an automatic retrieve is granted after the, the gunner or the judge calls safety. If you have nothing but, let's say you find four birds and all of them are safeties. At the end of the brace, the judge will throw a bird for the handler to score the retreat. That score on that thrown bird will be applied to all four of the safety retreats. So if you have two five or two retreats that are 80 and two safeties, all four, all four uh, retrieves are given an 80 score. Now, Dean. Yes. I have a scenario for you on the multiple bird thing because this happens quite a bit. Okay. Um, I've seen. So, as a judge, you see three birds on the ground. The dog goes in, holds on one bird. Handler goes in and flushes and shoots. Now, I have two dogs in my kennel that will hold on those other birds if they haven't left. Now, going back, you said you can only be scored on one bird, but if I, I would almost have to put a bird up for my dog to go. Like, if there's birds on the ground in front of that dog, he won't move. Right. So how would you do that scenario? It's, it's an awkward situation. You, you have a couple of options, and you're going to have judges even disagree about this. But technically, you have a bird that flies in one direction, and you shoot it, and your dog chases another bird. I'd see, a lot of times the handler will shoot that other bird for their dog. Okay, but what you're saying is the dog stays on point on the bird on the ground. The, by, by definition, you should be allowed to shoot that bird on the ground and just score the retrieve from that bird. But a lot of judges will probably have a problem with that. You might get a judge and, 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 and again, it's one of those gray areas in Astra where it's really difficult to describe. You're going to probably slash on your retrieve and those marked birds, you're going to have to call your dogs off and, and take and go away someplace and mark those and you'll get a slash for a retrieve. You won't get a zero. Your dog didn't refuse to retrieve. You're going to get a slash. The dog didn't have an opportunity to retrieve. Now, as a handler, and this might help on the judging side too, I would want to mention to the judge, can I move those two birds and then send my dog for that retrieve? Is that something that can be discussed between judge and handler? Yeah, and what they're going to say, probably tell you this, is that they're marked birds. If you move them, you can't score them. But you say, well, that's fine because I just need my retrieve. Yeah, that's something that can be discussed. Right, right. And definitely, any communication between you and the judge to try to clarify what your options are is best. And the more experienced judge, in my case, what I would do is I would tell you, if you want, go shoot that bird on the ground that your dog's pointing. Get it flushed, shoot it, so you can score that one, if there's one. If there's two, now you're getting kind of ugly. You're losing opportunity. You could probably do it. But that's because then as long as there is a retrieve out of one of those two birds, like you say you just one like, you're only yeah. allowed you one find one and then send your dog as long as your dog comes back with a bird that's classed as a retrieve. Yep. Perfect. Correct. At any time a judge may call a, a judge or a gunner may call safety. However, if that bird clears. Let's say a bird starts flying towards the judge and the judge goes, safety. 
the bird clears the judge and swings away and it's flying someplace where it's not in jeopardy of being hurting somebody. The gunner can say, can I shoot the bird? You can ask for permission to shoot the bird after it clears. You're a, a judge will often encourage you to, to shoot. You, you safety a bird because it's right above your dog's head, you yell safety because you, you're in danger of shooting your dog. You don't want to shoot your dog, so you call safety. All of a sudden, the bird flares up and flies to the side. Can I shoot it? Can I shoot it? You can ask the judge yes. If the judge says yes, you can do it. However, you're not going to get a retrieve score other than the average because you had already called safety. All you're doing is preventing your dog from chasing it, keeping it from flying around in the field, so on and so forth. Because you called safety, it's been established that you're going to get an average retrieve based upon your other retrieves. However, if you shoot a bird after safety, shoot after safety's been called, your retrieve will get taken away. And if you endanger a judge, you probably get thrown out of the field, okay? Safety first. So if you shoot after somebody's yelled safety and nobody's given you permission to shoot and you shoot anyway, you will re lose your retrieve. They will take that bird retrieve away from you because you violated the safety rule. But you also just can't call safety to call safety. Yeah. You can't call safety because the bird is just flying and you, it, you've got to have a shell in your gun. If you fire twice and then all of a sudden call safety, you have an over and under, you only got two shells. Sorry, you can't call safety with an empty gun. Make sense? Am I boring everybody? All right. Just tell me and I will quit. All averages or safeties are, are rewarded with an A average. Um, if a retrieve is not scored because a shot were fired after safety, a slash is placed on the card. I, I disagree with this. I think it should be a zero because a zero is a lot different than a slash, but it's a slash. The gunner must have one live round in their gun before a safety will be allowed. I've seen guys fire three times and then yell safety. Well, the judge has to make sure that the gunner can prove that they have a shell left in their gun in order to grant the safety. And it has to be a true safety. I've had, like even when I was in Indiana, I called safety because I turn around and I swear I saw orange and in my mind, to me, that's a safety. As soon as I see orange in my mind, it's a safety. But that bird had, I still had a clear shot at that, at that bird that would not have endangered anybody else. And the judge wouldn't let me use it as a safety. And I had to take a slash. I had to take a zero. Or a slash, sorry. Right. If the, if the dog, let's say the bird falls in heavy cover or the bird falls and the dog didn't see where it went down. It started running one way and the bird went the other way and he shot it. You don't give the dog a zero. You give the dog a slash. A zero is for when a dog refuses to pick up a bird. That's the difference. And what's a slash again, Dean? A slash just means you're not getting a score, good or bad. Oh. If you haven't, so, and where it becomes important, let's say you, sh you have four birds found. You retrieve two of them, you get a zero on one, and you get an average. Well, basically your average is supposed to be on all of your retreats. Well, one of your retrieves was a zero. You refused to retreat. You had two 80s and a zero, you got 160 divided by three. That will be your average that's placed on the fourth one. However, if you get 80, 80 slash safety or average, now you've got 160 divided only by two because you don't count the slash against you. So then your fourth bird's retrieve is going to be an 80 as well. 
instead of being averaged against a zero. So there's a big difference between a slash and a zero from that standpoint. Right, and, and again, a slash is given, if my dog's been hunting and hunting and hunting and hunting for a retrieve, cannot locate that bird no matter what we do, and I don't wanna spend any more time on it, I'm gonna say, I gotta give it up, I gotta move on. And so that's, as soon as I take my steps, I give up that retrieve as a handler. So as soon as I take my, I said, I'm gonna, I gotta give it up, that becomes a slash, meaning my dog, I just, I gave up the retrieve. Now, if your dog goes over to a bird, let's say you shoot a bird and you just barely wing it and keeps flying, keeps flying and flies off a long ways, but you and the judge see the bird go down. Now your dog's hunting, looking all over, all of a sudden it runs over and points the bird that you know is the one he's supposed to be retrieving, but he's on point. Do you yell at your dog to break point to make the retrieve? Your dog may think it's a brand new bird. You may be undoing a lot of quality training. You're better off sometimes to just say, I'm going to take a slash. I'm going to go over there and shoot this bird because my dog thinks it's pointing a different bird. It's forgot about the retrieve. At that point in time, you're going to get a slash. It wasn't because your dog refused to retrieve it. It's that your dog pointed it. But you can, you can't, I mean, depends on how broke your dog is. There's been times when my dog has flash pointed a bird that is supposed to be retrieving. I just say fetch and that my dog will jump in. I mean, so it's just a matter of how broke you want your dog to be or if you want to risk undoing anything at that point too. A judge needs to grab all the dead birds. It's Sorry, dead. Can, I, can I back up and ask a question on the, on the safety? Yes. So um, can the backing dog handler call a safety? Can the backing dog handler call? Oh, absolutely. Anybody can. Anybody okay. in the field can call a safety at any time. Yep. Okay. Now, the, the backing dog handler has to have good, obviously, good reason because I can see them using, I can see it being used um, inappropriately yep. if for their favor. Yeah. I, I would, if, if somebody did it, and they had no reason, I would give them a warning that that was very unsportsmanlike and that, uh, you know, the person that was, that had the uh, pointing dog, they're going to get an average retrieve. And if that dog is, uh, ends up chasing that bird around because he wasn't allowed to shoot it, and it, it, it's just, that's very unethical. Yeah. But for you example, know. I've been holding a backing dog, the bird flushes, flies right at my face and I'm yelling, safety, 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 <laughs> as holding the backing dog, you know? Right. But yeah, there, for sure, that's an obvious, but I'm, uh, yeah. Could it be misused? Yes, I, I could see it happening. I, I've done this for a long time. I've never heard of it happening, but in theory, could it happen? Yeah, I suppose. But I've been holding a backing dog and I've had to yell safety myself. Yeah, absolutely. Most of the time, most of the time, everybody recognizes. Some people get very excited and, and still to this day, very experienced handlers get excited and make shots they shouldn't. And uh, a judge is at discretion to remove that bird from that person for doing that. Judge needs to collect dead birds. You uh, don't want somebody going out with a half live bird being retrieved to them, they put it in a bird bag or something and they walk along and uh, later just drop the bird and the dog comes along and points it. You can see where ethics gets involved in this. Go take all the, go take all the scored birds. The, that kind of stuff can, can be avoided. Um, make sure, yeah, don't allow them to bag the birds basically. Back is when the dog sees the other points remain stationary. And un if the handler doesn't see the backing dog, can the judge call back for him? Can the judge begin scoring? Yes. Another thing that will happen is, is if a handler is a long ways away and the dog comes and backs the pointing dog, here sits the handler of the pointing dog waiting for the other handler who's maybe a quarter of a mile away in the field to come over to grab his dog before he can flush the bird. Once a dog is on point, you yell back, you have to make the person's hold that is flushing the bird. 
they have to wait for the backing dog to be grabbed. They can't continue with the flushing of the bird. A judge can recognize that situation and can go over and grab the backing dog and hold it for the handler. Now the handler can't stop, say, oh, the judge has got it. I'm just gonna wait over here because I want my dog to come back over. <laughs> you can't do that. You have to continue walking and make an attempt to get to your dog while the handler or while the judge is holding your dog. Once the, the judge has a hold of the backing dog, the pointing dog handler can proceed with the flush. But question, Dean. question, Dean. I'm a judge. I reached out, I, that handler's a long ways away. I reach over to grab that backing dog. I jump, get off my bike, go over to ha grab that backing dog. That backing dog jumps away from me, leaves the back or relocates itself on the back, but is more worried about me than the back at that point. Okay, if the dog leaves the back, because if, if the judge, if the, you feel that the judge intimidated the dog, you can't score the back. You, all you can do is give the dog another opportunity. Everybody got that? Okay, dog must back on his own. A handler can't command a dog to back, woo, and then call back. Again, back to what you see on the video. If, uh, Dean, sorry, I just, I just lost my train of thought on that back. I had a question. Yep. I was told, I'm just trying to think of the scenario. So you have a back, um, the, the handler, the backing handler is a ways away. The judge will go and grab that backing dog. And somebody had told me, I can't, I can't remember the scenario. Is it the backing handler that can request that he doesn't want the judge to hold him? Yep. Um, that he, he wants to wait until he gets to handle the dog? If, if, it's, if it's reasonable. You can't reasonable. use it. You can't use it as a stall tactic, John. If you if that handler is a long ways away, and the guy sitting there and he he's I mean, let's say I've got a three bird to two bird lead on you, and you just found your second bird. We know there's there's very little time left. I can just take no, don't touch my dog. I'm going to handle it. You'll you'll intimidate my dog, and I just dawdle along, and it takes me two minutes to get over there. And there's only three minutes left in the brace. Right. You can't use it as a weapon. You can request that you don't do it if it's appropriate and it's a reasonable amount of time, and the other handler agrees to it. Then yeah, you can you can get away with that, especially with young dogs, that kind of thing but it can't be used as a tool to gain an advantage. So it's, a, it's kind of the judge's discretion, John. Okay. You can ask a judge not to handle your dog. I've got a young dog, he doesn't recognize people. Um, if, if at all possible, let me get to it. You can request it. That's okay. all I can tell you. Okay. I mean, I mean, you have to look at the situation and how it's being used. If it's a beat your brace mate at a national trial, you, you and you're at a national trial. You should have a dog that should be allowed to be grabbed by a judge. If you're d duly dallying along and not hustling to get over there, you could be trying to use it for an advantage to prevent the outcome to be swayed. So again, judge's discretion. You can request it if they understand the reasoning. As long as it's not being abused, they grant it usually. Okay. Judges should be shutting off their bikes when they have a, a situation like a back about to happen. You want to make sure you can hear your handlers, especially when you see a dog getting ready to make a fine, you see a dog getting ready to make a back. Try to shut your bikes off as often as you can because you want to be in position to hear if they're commanding their dogs to whoa, to get a back, a bird maybe it was a, a bird they saw walking around on the ground they're trying to they're trying to command their dogs to stop sometimes dog will stop and they don't have a reason for stopping well you get very suspect that they're not in the scent cone and all of a sudden they're stopping why that's probably because you didn't hear the the owner command the dog to wool they're they're kind of cheating you out of a bird that's walking around on the ground 
same is true of a backing dog. If you think the owner commanded the dog to point, a zero should be awarded. We talked about the relocation. Um, one of the rules in Astra that's real uh, interesting is if a dog comes in and goes on point, the other handler comes in and has a backing dog. If the dog on point relocates on his own, the real controversial thing is, is a backing dog doesn't have to be held at that point. You can let that backing dog go. Now, the problem is, is you should be commanded to do so by a judge. But a lot of these guys been playing the game, do it on their own. So you have pointing dog, backing dog comes in and backs. The handler goes looking for the bird without commanding his dog to relocate. The dog relocates, starts look, running around looking for a bird. The backing dog, does he have to stay there any longer? No, you let him go. Okay. Questions? Time on the backing dog. Remember the three minutes, two minutes in, the dog has to, pointing dog has to be relocated. At the end of three minutes total time, the dog can be, backing dog can be allowed to relocate. The handler can relocate by touch, whistle, or command. You have to ask and notify the judge that you're doing it. Otherwise, it'll be considered a relocation on its own. And usually what most people do will circle with their hand, just put a little circle up like I'm doing right now and say, I'm relocating. You don't have to say anything. You can go over there and then a lot of people just tap their dog on the head and they release it. Blaze orange, safety green. You got to look at your local laws. Some states only recognize orange. Some allow green or orange. No birds shot on the ground unless the judge gives you permission. No guns can be fired just for purposes of calling your dog or trying to get them attention. No running in the field. If you uh, run in the field, uh, you could stand to lose the fines on that bird. In a national trial, they tell you in the blind, this is your first and only warning. If you're out there, you're going to have the bird taken away from you if somebody decides you're running. No dog may be grabbed and put on a leash just because the owner isn't happy with the dog. You have to continue letting them run. You'll see, you'll see handlers that you know, don't like the way their dog's working or don't think they're finding birds. If a dog is non-competitive, and let's just say it's pottering around, it's not really hunting for birds, the owner may say, well, I want to pick up my bird, my dog. Well, you can't do that until 10 minutes is expired. It has to be in that position for 10 minutes. The only reason you could pick up a bird, a dog immediately is if the dog is injured, the dog is fighting, that's it. Otherwise, you've got to let it do what it's doing for at least 10 minutes. Then after 10 minutes, if you've decided that it's non-competitive or that it's, you know, not doing what it's supposed to be doing, or it's, you know, it's taking out one bird and the owner wants to pick it up right away. You can't let them do that. The hey, great, yes. Sorry. How about like health issues like uh, heat stroke or something? Can a judge, you know, yep. with the handler yep. pushing the dog? Yep. You feel it's heating up you can probably say uh, consider it consider it an injury if if if, up. if you can see that a dog is distressed as a judge even if the handler doesn't think you can tell the handler go over there and uh, check on your dog because I'm, I'm worried about your dog okay. a judge can request it a handler can request it again it's a judge's discretion yeah. time has to be called a replacement dog has to be located. Both both dogs have to be leashed. Go from there. If a dog breaks loose from the gallery, enters the fields where the dogs are working, you stop the brace until the until the dog can be removed. If a dog from another field runs into your field and points a bird, 
What do you do? Stop, well, stop the clock. You can stop the clock or you can mark that bird and let the other handler come and get it. And that bird is marked for three minutes because now you both know where there's a bird, right? So it's not really fair. So you got to mark that bird for three minutes. A dog goes on point. Now, if a dog from another field runs in and grabs a bird out of your field and takes it out, you stop the brace, you notify the bird handler, you tell both handlers to turn their backs, you go have the bird planter replant that bird. Because unfairly, they had a bird removed from their field from a bird from another field. Some of this is just common sense stuff. And, and you'll have to work through it. Hopefully your field marshals watching your fields and can communicate and you can get the, those kind of situations cleared up. Okay, sometimes handlers are not the gunners. Okay, you can have six people in the field total. You can have people sitting. If you have a side-by-side, -side, you can have people sitting and watching from the side by side or you could have situations where the handler let's say it's a young kid or it's somebody that's not a confident shooter you can say i want to have a gunner who's ever going in the field needs to be in the blind so they can't communicate where the birds are being planted and they must walk out in the field now one of the beautiful things of NASTA right now is that we have what's called a mentoring program. If you're new to NASTRA, you're allowed a mentor for eight braces. That person will be allowed to communicate and tell you how to do it, what to do, how to, where to go, that kind of thing. However, if you're an experienced handler, more than eight braces, and you want somebody to gun for you, that person has to walk 15 feet behind you, stay in that position, and you cannot communicate in the field. Oftentimes you see gunners walking behind their handler in a different area and they're looking for birds on the ground. It can create an unfair advantage. So you have to follow the person you're gunning for and you must stay quiet. You cannot talk. There's no communication after leaving the blind. Use of training aids are not allowed. Spike collars, two, two collars, electronic devices, you know, bells, anything like that. Some, some people want to have two collars. You can't, one collar is only is allowed. Doesn't matter, no matter what. Judges' decisions are final. Rules that want to be protested can be protested. Harassment can be allow it can have the person removed from the field and all all runs on that field being forfeited and when ideal you have a judge judge one dog for half the brace and the other dog for the other make sure that you're scoring fairly both dogs field marshals are required field marshals job is to watch for birds flying over to make judgment decisions on uh, rules interpretations uh, make sure you have by dogs available that kind of thing um steve can i ask a question on the callers yes if uh, you know those Britneys, they all look alike <laughs> so as a judge can you ask for different colored collars or do you just rely on the handlers that they're going to be working their dog <laughs> just if a dog's out 100 yards you might not know which one it is i i be careful my wife's a Brittany girl so hey. you don't... that's why i said that <laughs> <laughs> so am i <laughs> yeah um because we always make a joke at the beginning we we're like i've got the Brittany with the orange collar <laughs> Yeah, you just gotta really be paying attention. It it, it does happen. It, you just yeah, you gotta it, know. It happens when I've had I've got the black and white setter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, it happens with short hairs. It happens with Britneys. It just it, you just gotta be careful. I, I mean, I I I can't tell you a foolproof method. You can't force them to switch collars, or some if that's where you're going with that question. 
Yeah, it's just some of the other games that we play, you know, top dog is, yeah. is, is no. the orange and bottom dog is green, right? Yeah. No, you can't force them to change colors. You hope that they have some identifying marks, but it's not. In order to be a judge, you have to be a NASTRA member for six months. So some of you have probably been, those of you that aren't, we're just doing this to learn the game. Must be 18 years. Can you ask a question on that? Yeah. I did not renew my membership last year. Um, it was active for the previous year. Does that count as my six months or do I got to start over? I believe if you call the office and ask them that question, they're going to allow you to, uh, to uh, take the test. By the way, if you are in That's that situation perfect. where you've been a member for six months, you can, because we had to do this by video, they, the office said that you can register for the online course and take the, take the test online. But what I would encourage you to do is I hurried through this and I missed questions on the test. I would open up the rule book on the, the web page and I would go through it a little more detail. Because we we kind of breeze through a lot of this just for the expediency. Okay. But I think you they would allow you to. Um when you do get your card, you must serve as an apprentice for eight braces. You will be issued a scorecard. You will ride along with the judge. You will discuss what the scores you think should be. You don't have to put the same score as the judge. You can put your own score down. That's the beauty of it. It's a judgment thing. But the idea is, is that when you are done, you will have got a feel for actually judging in the field. And uh, hopefully you, you, both, you both feel like you're comfortable with being a judge. You must complete your apprenticeship within six months of your, your judging test. The judge's cards to be issued, oh, three years. Three year period. You asked me if it was one year, two year, it's three years. Um, it's, these are recommendation should actually judge six trials in a three year period. We, my wife and I judge probably six trials in the spring and two or three trials every fall. So we probably judge almost six trials a year. Uh, maybe even more than that. Actually, I know I do more than that. Judge will be notified when their card, this is just stuff that yeah. must have been judged. I'm just wondering, wondering here as us as Canadians we uh -huh. wouldn't see we wouldn't see you know six trials in a year we're lucky like southern Ontario we see maybe two right like how, and we can't cross into the states right now because of the virus correct uh, Again, how, how are we going to get these six tests I in think he said the, six six in three years right Six and yeah, three. but you got you said something about serving your uh, apprenticeship within. And and I talked to Michael about all this. Michael is the vice president right now, and I explained all of these scenarios, and he said, Dean, we obviously are trying to make this whole thing work. And he says we're gonna we're gonna waive some of this just for these folks to get this off the ground. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they've been good about a lot of this, Don. They're going to yeah. be real good about a lot of this because they want you folks on board. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, Dean of field marshals, they need to have a judging card, right? Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about some other things. Let's say you're actually going to go out and run dogs. Okay. You have a field. Let's say it's 40 acres. It's perfectly square. Five birds are planted normally. The only time five birds isn't planted is when? Anybody know? First brace. First brace. First brace is six birds. They do six birds. After that, if, uh, if the reason that is, is because those people have no, no chance of having a bird carry over from previous brace. First brace, six birds are planted. 
scatter it. But the other 15 braces, if it's full, there'll be five birds planted. If you have a perfect square, most bird planters are instructed to plant the field as fair a manner as possible. So how would that be? Where would you put the birds? Uh, well, quadrants are what we learned up here. I mean, four corners in the middle. Four corners in the middle. That's that's the basic idea behind planting a bird, a bird field fair. Four corners in the middle. Now, one of the things that new handlers often don't do very good job of is paying attention to the other handlers. You, you're so busy watching your dog and watching where your dog goes, you don't have any idea what the other handler is doing, where the other handler is finding birds. So the really, really good handlers probably watch the other person's dog more than they watch their own, because they know that if their dog goes on point, what's going to happen? Their judge is going to say point and tell them. So what happens, what's, what's really frustrating for people, it's like me watching my wife, for instance, is when she's watching her dog and she follows and goes in and, and gets a couple of birds, and then she goes over and walks to a part of the field where the other handlers already found the bird. And so she spends five minutes hunting for a bird that doesn't exist anymore because the other handlers already did. If you're using these guidelines that there's five birds, one in each quadrant, and then one in the middle, if you're watching the other handler find birds as long as you're finding birds, the difference between finding three and finding one might be paying attention to him, knowing where he's found birds, he or she has found birds, and making sure you don't go there after they I have. like I'm new. <laughs> I, trust me, it, it's it's almost broke up our marriage when me I'm watching my wife around her dogs and she starts walking around following where people have already found honey, her. Honey, <laughs> honey, let's have a conversation later. Okay. So does that make sense? I mean, part of that is, is strategy. And a lot, of, a lot of strategy involves knowing where the other person has been. The other part of strategy is paying attention to the bird plan. The bird planner goes out, he might not cover a certain part of the field the brace before. He might, you watch, you might figure out where the five birds are planted the brace before. If you watch that brace that runs before you, you might be able to see where the other bird, the other dogs in the brace before you didn't find all of their birds and you know where the bird planner went so you know where to go you know I got you a blackjack table it's 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 <laughs> like counting cards if there's extra birds out there you can take advantage of it you know it, it's the difference between advancing or not advancing a lot of times at a national trial it's because you know where there's an extra bird in the field and the other handler doesn't or you know where there's an extra bird and you uh, can uh, keep it in your back pocket for when you need it, so to speak. You can go get it late. Go get the birds that are planted in your brace and then go get that bird that's on the edge of the field where a person wouldn't normally look. I mean, there's a lot of little subtleties to this game that you have to do really well. Bird planters often have patterns. I'll, I, I just got done with a national trial in September. We did very well. We got a second and a third out of 128 dogs in the country. Part of that reason why we did so well, not necessarily because I think I had better dogs. I think part of the reason was is I figured out the bird planner's pattern. I knew when we found, he had a couple of patterns. When I found one bird, I knew where the rest of the birds were in the field. Some people never figure that out. Some people don't pay attention. Some people don't see patterns because they don't play the game hard enough. Part of it is just letting your dogs do their job and following them and, and enjoying that. Part of this is being competitive. I, I, I like to tell people, you know, I was an ex high school jock. I played football, I played basketball, I ran track. 
I competed. I went to college, played college ball. I, I did all that. I competed. I, you know, you name it, if there's a sport, I was competitive. And that was the thing. Well, I'm almost 60 years old now. Okay. I can't play with the best people in the world in football. I can't even play anymore. I can't play with Michael Jordan in basketball. But what I can do at my age is I can play with the best people. Now, I can't golf with Tiger Woods, but I can run dogs with Greg Woods. I, I mean, this is the beauty of NASTRA is, is people can go out at 18 years old and win a NASTRA event. People can go out at 80 years old and win a NASTRA event. It, it doesn't discriminate by age. It discriminates by the quality of the dog she runs. Or and gender. For the on this thing, or gender, I'm here to tell you. Well, and the judges make a big part in that too. Mm -hmm. But does anybody have any questions? I know we went through a lot. Is there anything you want me to cover that I haven't covered? Jeff, John, Don, Josh, anybody? Me personally, I can't think of anything. I think it's like you said, we're going to have to go through the rule book and uh, just fine tune anything that you missed or touched, didn't touch on and uh, take the test and then do the apprenticeship and just rock from there. Yeah. And uh, hopefully by next spring, if they, if they open up, uh, if they open up Canada, what we would like to do is we would like to come up and, uh, and uh, help out. We would love to come up. I know the Michigan folks have come up and helped over there. Uh, I, I know the Mid-North folks and the Big Sky folks have come up and help in Manitoba. Saskatchewan. So hopefully we can get this all put together. I think that's the only way to do it. Like I said, that's how we started expanding here. You know, Townsend and all his crew came up. It was great. Um, you know, a bunch of experienced judges. They loved what we were trying to do. And, uh, we just been rocking since then, so yeah. hopefully Jeff can kind of do the same. I know you guys are close on the border there uh, with, with his group. So, and and if the border opens up, you don't have to be invited to come down. Just plan it, you know, and running in trials and some of the state regions that are close to you because you know we're always looking for guys. We're always looking for competitors. We not only can we go up there, but you guys can come down. Yeah, that was really Michigan. So it's uh, it's great to see the difference, especially in judging. That's what intrigued me. You know, the the, the quality of of judging and the scores and how 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 it's so different. So it was, it was really a wake up call. Yeah. Well, that's why I I really wanted you to just see videos. I I have the whole dog of the year from 2018 on video. I just showed you bits and splices of it. When we get done here, if if you want to, that video presentation of dog work that you know I showed in the beginning, that that's a good 45 minutes long. I will just I'm gonna turn it on play. And if you want to stay on and watch it, you're welcome to. It shows it shows a lot of dog work. And uh, the other thing we have on YouTube on our I think I posted it. It's also on our website, on the Mid North website. We have about a 15 minute video, 10 minute video from our our triple, triple, triple that we held last year. Show some okay. amazing dog work too. Some amazing finds, some amazing retrieves. Some just, it's, it's, only, it's just a short 10 minute clip. Yeah, and that's on the Mid North website. Anybody else? Any, is there anything, questions or comments or anything general? This is Vince, just something I, I, I'll share. I know when I did my apprenticeship, you, you got a couple of choices. You can ride along with the judge, grab your own four wheel and ride beside him. I had an opportunity to sit in a side by side with the judge. And I found that, that to be a, uh, an excellent experience because you get to talk to the judge that whole brace as opposed to you know, just when you pull up and you shut your engines off. So if there's an opportunity to sit with an old, uh, a good judge in a side by side, I would jump on that. I, and I was just going to tell you, when you go to set up your trials, if you can round up 
side by sides for that purpose. That is the best scenario. Not only can you, you can put apprenticeships in there, you can put people in there with video cameras or still photography. We have a couple of gals in our region that love to ride along and do camera work. And you should see the quality. If you, again, go to our region's webpage, the Mid North Master webpage. If you go there, there is some photography that it would just floor you. I mean, it shows dogs on point, and it shows birds out in the open walking around. And the files on our Facebook page, on our Mid North Facebook page. If you go into the files, it'll show all those. Um, even this spring. Uh, I was just going to jump in there on that, Dean. You were talking at the beginning about going on the Sportsman Channel. Um, if there's something you want to do up here in Canada to advertise on Wild TV, let me know because I can uh, make that happen. We can talk after about that. You can? Well, let me. Yeah, I, I currently run Wild TV. So. Well, let, me, let me give you some more background, Josh. Two years ago, when I put this video together, I did it on my own. I was running for the national president position. And one of my campaign things was, is that we need to get this out there and we need to expose it. And they wouldn't let the cameramen be in the side-by-side -side to get good quality photos. They had to videotape from the observation tower. Well, Unfortunately, the quality of the camera work was from too far away, but we've done video from the side by side up to back. And it is so wonderful that it's one thing I'd like to, I'd like to have a regular weekly uh, television uh, spot where we would do national trials, regional trials, weekend trials, and just have a whole season long deal it would be great advertising. It would uh, generate some revenue. It would be, I think it's a win-win for the organization. That's kind of the way I'm gearing my TV show next year is I wanted to uh, be able to post some of the dog events like between dog shows and STRE, um, CKC. We filmed some CKC a couple of years ago. I just made Charlene follow us around with a camera. Can you, can you get a hold of me on Messenger with your contact information, Josh? And let's yeah, try I to, certainly can. Let's try to work that out. Because I would like to have you guys do that right at your very first event. Yeah. Also, the uh, general manager from Wild TV moved moved over to the Sportsman Channel too, Helgi. So, um, Sportsman Channel is now in Canada, so that's kind of a double opportunity as well. Awesome. I, that's that's one of my big ideas is to grow and develop this sport, and that's one of my things. And I know uh, Lawrence Panetti, when I got this film, I wanted to show you folks this video. And a, a sad story, I'll tell it, but I don't want to take all your time. One of the people that was doing the interviewing had his own agenda, and he had different dog food brands represented and different things than our sponsors are on his person. And so when our master board of directors looked at it, they said, we can't use this. So we had to throw the whole thing out, even though it was already done and paid for. I remember watching that one. Did you? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one that uh, I was going to show you here at the end. Yeah. The biggest challenge up here, I mean, we've had some exposure and stuff. And um, Josh, your, your channel may be a little better, but we, we just got to tread lightly in Canada. You know, you get the wrong people and uh, it's, uh, you got the, uh, you know, you'll have PETA knocking on your door. Do you uh, have access to the birds? What's that? How is your access to birds? Birds is great. I mean, it's one supplier mainly, but it's more, what I'm talking about is, you know, how we dispose of the birds, things like right. that. When that starts getting out on TV and video, it could right. really backfire. Right, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Make sure you show them being used. Yeah. Have somebody clean it and pick them up. Well, we had we had trials in Cranbrook, BC, and in British Columbia. Now you cannot shoot a bird um, that's been released for 24 hours, so you yeah, can't you have it against that anymore. Isn't it amazing? Fighting lightly with some of these people, you know. Isn't it amazing? Some of the idi idiotic 
tools that are out there. That's fair chase, huh? What, the one that surprises me is we're no longer allowed to use quail because they found six quail on an island in the St. Mary's River, so they put them on the endangered species list. So on our CKC hunt test, we have to use truckers now instead of quail. Oh my goodness. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, the bigger problem is here in Ontario training with quail. Nobody can have access to quail unless you're at a game farm or you have a permit for it, and that's a game or farm. Or you got to use a cotern. You can use cotternics, but they're not the great flyers either. Right, so. and newbies, you know, it's, it's yeah. a learning curve. But, in you know. uh, Iowa, because it's a native species, they have to ban the owners. Oh yeah, they ban on. Yeah, no, no, they found six on an island in the St. Mary's River, and that was it. They went on the endangered species list, and they lot them off. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that was that was my bad. I was training there that weekend and released them. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> so, Dean, is that the whole uh, presentation then? Yeah. I I I I could go on forever. Obviously, <laughs> as far as being part of the main body of work, we're pretty much covered it all. Okay. Uh, I would encourage you if you've had. A, if you've been a judge for six months, so I would go through the rule book. I skipped through a lot of this just for trying to get you guys through it. But uh, there's more detail. It, it helps to take a judging test after you've played the game for a little bit, because then these questions jump up and flow. Well, everybody tells me it makes you a better handler because you actually see first oh, hand in the field, right? I tell you what, I love to judge all across the country because there's two reasons why. And when I first started this game, number one, I wasn't very good. Number two, my dogs weren't very good. And I got out and started judging and all of a sudden I went, wow, I really like this dog. And I learned that dog's pedigree and I went, man, these dogs can play. And so when I travel across the country to this day, I still am in that position where I go, wow, this is a great dog. This is a quality dog breeding right here. And I put it in the back of my brain. Well, I'm still not a very good dog trainer. I've had a lot of help and probably one of the best dog trainers in the country still begins to train all my dogs. I try to finish it, but I try not to screw up what he's done. He, if he puts the foundation on it, I take him from there. Well, what happened was, is I realized that the dogs I had could never play this game and win. Do you remember me telling you the story of being so competitive that this is one of the things that if I want to be competitive, I have to get better at? Well, a lot of it wasn't possible with the dogs I have. So by judging and seeing a lot of people's dogs and being open-minded, you travel the country judging, you see the dogs you want to get pups out of. And so my wife and I have probably some of the most, well, quite frankly, some of the best bloodlines in the entire country, not because we raised them, but because we went to the people that raised the best dogs in the country and got their pups. Now, our pups are in the hands of good handlers across the country and are making a name for themselves. And so it wasn't because we started with good dogs. It's our Britneys. I just want to say that. Our Britneys. <laughs> but the, because we, we, we were able to judge across the country all over and see good dogs and see what we wanted and, and develop our program from them. So... Yeah, I, I, I love to judge for that purpose, is to just see the difference between good dogs. Oh man, I need to really work on my dogs on this or that. Or, and I've been real fortunate to have good breeders across the country trust me with their dogs and uh, develop them. So, I think with myself, 15 years ago when I started judging for the CKC, the eye opener was the common mistakes that a lot of handlers made that you wouldn't normally see unless you were in the field judging and then worked on there and said, okay, now I know what my dog is expected to do. So when I started, when I started this game about eight years ago with Dean, 
And I said, I want to do this. This looks like it's super fun, but I want to do my own dog, which is why we ended up getting, getting into Britney's. But long story short, he goes, you have to judge. I'm like, I don't want to judge. I don't know enough to judge. But it's when I started judging and really watching handlers and really paying attention. I've judged five or six of the pre-trials at nationals now, and you watch those good dogs and you watch those really good handlers. And then you go to a weekend trial and you watch the really bad handlers. And it's, it's that whole gamut of experiences that you bring together to make you a better handler when you're in the field. And it's huge. Judging changes everything for you as a handler. Yep, yep, I agree. Well, that's it. Um, I mean, Christy and Dean, thanks so much for taking uh, your Sunday off to, to do this for us. I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. Well put is, together. Thank you very is much. anybody interested in watching the video that we produced or not? Yeah, I would be. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me get my glasses back on. Let me fire it up for you. If uh, anybody wants to contact us, um, what would be best? I don't care. You can have my phone number or you can have my email. I already put your email out there. I'm going to, I'll put Dean and my phone numbers out there too. And I have everybody's, I have everybody's email that have put their emails into the chat. If you do not put your email into a chat, it's not a big deal. You can contact me. You can private message me on Facebook or you can email me or even text me or Dean um, here in the chat. I'm going to put Dean. I'm going to put that to everyone. Um, Dean's number is 701. Six nine zero six six seven one. Okay, I've got Julie now. J U L I. Okay. Gmail. Dean and Christy, thanks uh, from uh, okay. Manitoba here as well for putting this on. We really uh, appreciate this and all your efforts and trying to help us uh, get this going here. We uh, couldn't do it without you guys. That's for sure. Thank you. We can't wait for the border to open so we can come play with you. Yeah, I was hoping to come play with you this summer, but uh, okay. that just didn't happen. <laughs> no, we're, we're excited for you guys. You know, you guys are, will be probably our closest region. So if you guys can get events going, it would be nice to be able to jump across and, and uh, compete with you guys and uh, play together. So. I think Cam said the only thing that was really difficult about going across the border was taking firearms. So we always had a shotgun for him here. And so he just had to bring his dogs. He just had to have his, you know, his health certificates and everything else when he actually came across the border. But that was like six years ago, seven years ago. I'm not sure what that still looks like. So I think it's a US piece of cake now. We just get a, the ATF form and okay. US border guys yeah. are super cool. No, most of the time we're just uh, shooting the shit and they're they're intrigued uh, when they see everything. It's coming back where, where where we get more questions, but yeah, and that's true of us too. It's harder to get back into the states than it is to leave. Yeah. yeah. Going to Canada. I don't know why it's that way, but well, what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna roll this. This is an hour and 17 minutes long. So I'm just gonna roll this. Yeah, stay on as long as you want. Sign off if you need to, but. This is not on YouTube or anything, right, Dean and Christy? You don't have this on YouTube or anything? This particular no, video? Not this piece, but we could get it on YouTube. Yeah, I think it's gonna be less choppy. I think it's still, uh, this one's gonna be probably choppy. I mean, we'll see what it looks like, but I'm wondering if you can upload it and that way it's nice and clean. Might be able to. I'm, 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 until he comes home, because he doesn't have a clue. Trust me. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm sure my wife could probably figure it out. Do it real fast. I go five, yeah, five gigs. It's pretty right. big. I'm going to roll this. I'm going to blow it up, and uh, you folks look at it. And like I said, feel free to contact me if you have questions or, you know, anybody have questions about dogs, about training, about anything like that that we might need to cover? No. Dean and Christy, do you think you could send that to me on a USB drive? I could upload it for you to YouTube if you want. Yeah. We well, if you're going to put it on YouTube, Christy can do it for them. 
And I'm going to stop okay. the recording now too. Yeah, that's fine.